Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're excited to kick off the work of the Manufacturing Consortium today. I feel very far away from you, but this is where the microphone is the best. So I'm gonna stay put just for some opening remarks. I'm Jennifer Purcell. I'm the Director for Future Ready Oregon, and we're really excited to be kicking off the work of the Manufacturing Industry Consortium today. Thank you all for being here. Um, you should have in your packets a copy of the agenda, but we also have it uh, up on the slide, a couple of housekeeping items. This is a public meeting, so it is being broadcast. Just keep in mind that um, we will be moving about the room with microphones and reminding folks to speak up uh, if they're having trouble hearing us online. Um, Wi-Fi, my understanding is you're able to just connect. There's no password required. So if you need that or are having any trouble, please let one of our staff know. And then restrooms are just outside um, off the lobby here to my left. Um, and with that, uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and do a quick round of introductions. If you could just introduce name and organization, that would be great. Um, I think we're probably okay without the mic okay. just for introductions and then we'll launch into our agenda for the day. Mariah, do you wanna go ahead and kick us off? Wait, Scott? Yeah, Scott, we're in Oregon Business and Industry. Okay, they're Oregon State. Paul Sheldon, Golden Rule Reentry. Abigail Lewis, Golden Rule Reentry. Excellent. Tommy Lee Jones, also Blue Crystal. John Burris, Burris Grove High School. And Bentley, Oregon Department of Education. Golden Garden, Northwest. Aaron Sparks, Park Coffee Group. Hi, Eric Anderson with Fresh Forest Strategic Economic Development Corporation. Good morning, Steve Wolf, Eric Anderson. Good morning, Kyle, Lucy Wolf with the Oregon Business Good morning, I'm Brandon Bryant, the President and Director of Trust at W24. I have a huge team. Thank you so much. We also have a number of members of the Future Ready Oregon team and the Higher Education Coordinating Commission with us today supporting you all in this work. And um, I think with that, I am gonna turn it over to either Director Cannon or Chair Cross, whoever's going first, uh, to provide us with some opening remarks. Thanks, Um Well, I will go ahead uh, and go with first this morning. I really want to welcome you and thank you all for being here and being part of this task force. Um, as I said, I'm Terry Cross uh, and I chair the HEC. I'm founder and senior advisor at the National Indian Child and Welfare Association and um, I was executive director of that organization for 35 years. I, it has been a pleasure for me to attend uh, these task force meetings. Um, I, I was able to attend the uh, entire time, the first two, and get closing remarks today. I can only open because I've got other obligations um, later in the day. But um, it is such a privilege to be um, part of this co creation of statewide and sector specific workforce talent development strategy holding session. Um, your job is really to engage um, with one another and others in your field, help develop that diverse workforce. And by bringing together the educators and leaders and trainers uh, from 
and community representatives um, to take um, advantage of a moment in time that is both important and urgent. Some of you know the um, Covey literature, I'm sure, and, and his matrix of, of the urgent and important. Um, our legislature enacted uh, Future Ready Oregon, and the funding is time limited and finite, and but it represents a tremendous opportunity to make decisions to act jointly. And I, one of the things I have done a lot in my career, um, I'm a social worker by training. I do a lot of community development work. And one of the areas I train on is collaboration, mostly in, in systems of care for children's mental health. And, and the things that I've learned about uh, collaboration um, is that every collaboration should be win-win. It's got to be good for all concerned entering into that collaboration. It is a decision to act jointly that enhances the capacity of each partner to have a better outcome than they would have by themselves. Collaboration also supports the integrity of each of the partners coming to that collaboration. Each has to maintain its own mission, its own set of values, its own uh, capacity to make its own independent decisions. Collaborations serve the greater good. And so uh, it is a, a process of developing a shared vision in this decision to act jointly. Uh, but collaboration, it's great at the visionary level, but if you don't put the infrastructure behind it, it doesn't tend to, to stick. And so collaborating requires investment, investment of time and investment of resources. If you're not budgeting for it, um, it's probably not going to happen. And if the leaders say, thou shalt collaborate, and your middle managers have their shoulders in their ears going, what's that mean? Then it's probably not going to happen. So I, I encourage you as you go from here. Today, you have the opportunity to meet new people, to make new relationships, to have important conversations, and take away from here opportunity. And those who are probably most likely to help you achieve that opportunity are the managers back at home, the folks who know how to get things done. And they need clarity and they need direction. And I hope that by being here today that you can thoughtfully get, get excited about what's possible and think about the work that it's going to take to get it done. Thank you all for being here. Well, thank you. Uh, again, I'm Megan Cannon. I'm the executive director of Oregon's Higher Education Coordinating Commission, and, and uh, I work for and with our chair, and we just met Terry Cross. Um, our governor appointed 15 member commission uh, oversees me and oversees the agency, and we are a state agency that supports Future Ready Oregon, and as well as a lot of other work in the higher education and training space. My role here is really simple it's to join Chair Cross in welcoming you and thanking you for your participation. In um, I, I do want to uh, say just a, a few words about the history of how we got here. Staff from the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, or HEC, uh, began working with uh, then Governor Brown's Racial Justice Council uh, several years ago, as well as other partners, to develop the legislation that became known as Future Ready Oregon. And in that work, I, you know, it was important, very important to the, to the governor and to the Racial Justice Council and to our staff to understand that Future Ready Oregon emerged out of um, an attempt to a desire to really meet two goals. One that had to do with was about racial justice and justice for other underrepresented Oregonians. The other is about meeting critical workforce needs, in particularly in manufacturing, healthcare, and in technology. 
And there was an understanding that those were mutually reinforcing, that in fact, racial justice requires economic justice and opportunity. And that uh, meeting our critical workforce needs requires engaging and supporting Oregonians who our systems have um, historically and today to some extent to uh, just put to the side or, or marginalized or created barriers for. So to understand these two principles is really intertwined and reinforcing and, and at the center of the work that uh, these consortiums help make today. Your leadership, you've been invited here uh, because you will help us understand uh, as state uh, leaders how to uh, address the current and emerging workforce needs for the manufacturing sector. Even more importantly, the collection of folks around this table representing uh, community organizations, representing education and training organizations and representing employers will help to guide and shape the investments that the state uh, through Future Ready Oregon and potentially beyond uh, makes in education and training and support for uh, for to sort of connect with jobs and careers in the economy. I really want to emphasize that this is a different model for how we thought about state investments and state strategies to support workforce development and support education and secondary education that we traditionally rely on. The way the state typically budgets and thinks about investments in education is to look at what we've done before and how, how are we supporting them through traditional public institutions and let's try to do a little bit more. This, uh, this model says let's listen to employers, let's li listen to community organizations with relationships within uh, the populations and communities where they want to support and connect their career, and let's listen to educators and let's bring those ideas together behind a set of strategies and investments to, to connect their workers to manufacturing careers. So really looking forward to what we learn and what you uh, bring to the table and find out how uh, we at the HACC, our staff, our resources can support the, uh, the ideas and, and empowerments in this group. So again, thank you for being here. We've got a great team of staff from the Higher Education Coordinating Commission whose role is really to support you and enable this consortium to thrive, so please let me or Jennifer or other members of the team know uh, what we can do to ensure that your participation here is as meaningful and impactful in this future. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Erin Sparks. I usually like to walk the room, but uh, because of the microphone situation, I'm going to try to stay close to this mic for now. Um, so like Jennifer said, I do feel a little far away from you. Um, but, but excited to be here. Um, I'm a consultant. I work at the intersection of workforce and economic development. I've worked with a lot of states and regions to launch industry-led partnerships. Um, I'm an affiliate of the Institute for Network Communities, which has um, launched regional uh, industry-led next-gen sector partnerships, which some of you may be familiar with, in more than 20 states. Uh, my colleague, Lindsay Woolsey, and I, are partnering to support HEC and WCBD to, with the launch of Future Ready Oregon Industry Consortium. A little bit of my background um, at the state level, I worked at the National Governors Association. At the federal level, I was at the US Department of Commerce um, as a senior advisor for manufacturing to Secretary Penny Pritzker during the Obama administration, um, where I was involved with a number of industry led advisory groups, um, including the US Manufacturing Council and the White House Subcommittee on Advanced Manufacturing. I recently, um, it, with my consulting work, I work with a lot of states. I recently worked with Pennsylvania to launch an industry-led state-level manufacturing advisory council that developed a playbook of three game changers for the incoming Bureau administration. Um, <clears throat> so I'm excited to be working with all of you. I think you're all aware of how significant an investment Future Ready Oregon is. Your input and expertise matter enormously to the success of this initiative. So I want to spend a few minutes just framing before we jump in to our day, um, why industry consortia matter at the state level. And a lot of people are familiar, like I said, working with the Institute for Network Communities and NextGen. You know, we've seen industry-led partnerships launch in more than 20 states. So people are probably more familiar we seen industry partnerships at the regional level. Oregon um, is, is really on the forefront of a smaller group of states that's trying to figure out and thinking about how do we take 
the success of what we've seen work at the regional level to really respond to industry needs and grow our economies in a new way. How do we take that and do that at the state level? It's different, it's challenging, but it's worth our time. Now more than ever um, is the time to push for deeper and more strategic partnerships, both at the local level and the state level. And I think an important piece is helping to make sure they're learning from each other and coordinating. Um, why is this so important now? I love this quote. I'm going to quote someone. <laughs> um, Bruce Katz at the Brooklyn Institution has said, the public sector in US cities, and we could probably say state regions, on a good day is a fragmented mess. Rather than curbing this fragmentation, federal largesse has enshrined it. That's Bruce's quote. <laughs> um, I think that business leaders have a unique ability to bring clarity and strategic vision that can mobilize that fragmented mess. I do think there's a lot of fragmented mess. <laughs> and I think we can see partnerships like this come together to, to bring that, that fragmentation together into a focused, coordinated network that can anticipate important opportunities and respond to shared challenges. Um, one thing that I'd really like to point about out about Oregon's approach, which I think is so unique and so important, is that you're also bringing community-based organizations to the same shared table with their unique insights into how to connect historically underrepresented populations to those opportunities. It's people-based economic development. A lot of people are talking about it. Not as many people are doing it. So it's really exciting to see you all doing that work. You have all the players all the right players at the table to make some big changes and to discuss what are the big opportunities, particularly as it relates to training and workforce development, talent development. And, and today, one of the things we wanna talk about is where do we need that clarity and that mobilization of a network that this partnership could bring? Now, let me talk about manufacturing for a minute and, and why manufacturing. Coming out of the pandemic, um, there's strong public interest in manufacturing. I think we've all seen that, where during the pandemic, manufacturers were really the backbone of their economy. Um, and it was really interesting as someone who's been working in manufacturing for a long time to suddenly see supply chain resiliency and <laughs> supply chain disruption as just like a topic of general discussion all of a sudden. We had a general interest in a strong public manufacturing sector in the United States, much more than everybody in the country. Um, you know, I saw more than ever interested in manufacturing. So there's been a lot of buzz about manufacturing, widespread agreement. We want to keep manufacturing here. We want to attract more young people, more diverse populations into manufacturing, and we want to strengthen advanced manufacturing in particular. And states like Oregon really putting a lot of thought into semiconductors <clears throat> in that sector and how do we strengthen that part of our economy. Most states are aware of the issues that their manufacturers face, um, labor shortages, complexity of adopting new technologies, supply chain disruptions. Um, more than ever, these are really complex issues that take more than one organization to address and it takes a partnership like this to address. So you all have a voice in helping the people of Oregon be prepared for jobs in manufacturing and the state of Oregon to make the right investment to make those connections between what companies need, what, what in terms of skills from people and how to um, grow jobs for the economy, specifically in manufacturing. So this is an industry consortium. So I, I want to speak directly to um, the companies and industry members in the room as businesses and as that, that voice of clarity of, of what industry actually needs. Um, we need your strategic insights. We, what, um, you, you can help us stay action-oriented and help us stay sustainable. What, in working across different states, launching state level, and regional level partnerships, but I think specifically at the state level, um, where it can be a little bit more challenging to have that sustainability. Um, what we've seen 
make industry-led partnerships successful at the state level. One, a clear mission with a continued reason for existence. It's usually a mix of policy and strategy and program execution. Two, strong leadership. And three, professional staff. So um, I have good news. You have all three of those things starting off. <laughs> so you have a really good foundation for kicking off this work. Um, and as a consortium, you have an immediate charge to inform future ready Oregon funding opportunities. And Jennifer is going to spend some time on that next. Um, there are going to be some short term objectives that may make this feel like a little bit of a sprint. The intention, though, is that this is going to be a marathon. So even um, you know, even though you're kind of starting with this unique short term charge, the consortia are intended to last beyond their initial charge to be the go to place for making strategic policy and funding recommendations to address gaps and opportunities. There is flexibility built into the charter to stand up agile working groups to address those those opportunities. There's also flexibility to add members. Um, and also want to point out that that not everybody is able to be here in the room today. We have a few folks. Um, I know a few companies in particular listening in. Um, but that's one question we'll be coming back to throughout the day. Who's missing? How we kick off is critical to get us on good footing to be action oriented and sustainable. I'm here to help guide the conversation today, keep us focused on both the short term and the long term objective. I'm part of a facilitation team, so I also want to introduce Turner O'Dell and give him a chance to talk about his role, and then he'll pass it back to me and we'll get into the nitty gritty what to expect today. Thank you, Aaron. I will reveal my face for everybody. <laughs> and I'm going to use the mic because the word is that standing here oh, is it's not, not working. working so well. So okay. um, and I'll try not to make it too loud. My name is Turner O'Dell. As Aaron mentioned, I work with the Oregon Consensus Program. Uh, it's part of the National Policy Consensus Center at Portland State University in the Hatfield School of Government. <clears throat> and Heck has asked us to assist. We, are, we operate in the field of collaborative governance. We help people collaborate on public policy issues. Um, and we uh, do that in a number of different sectors. Heck has asked us to assist as we move forward with the consortia. Um, you'll see me helping to facilitate the uh, quarterly meetings that, we'll, that you'll be um, attending um, in the coming months. So uh, today, I'm mostly in a support role. Phil Donahue of, uh, of the day, moving this microphone around to everybody. I'll tell like who knows what I'm talking about. And who doesn't, <laughs> uh, that. Um, but in any event, uh, I can assist if you all are having uh, issues or concerns about hearing or whatever, just let us know. And uh, we'll, we'll try to do that better. Thanks, Aaron. All right. I probably just got too far from the podium. I probably did. <laughs> all right. So let me just walk you quickly through what's in your packets. You may have already looked through it all. Um, so on the left side, you should find a copy of the agenda, a list of members, um, including bios, and I believe the charter. And then on the right side, you'll find a copy of the, the legislation, the bill that created um, Future Ready Oregon and Industry Consortia. And you'll also find some copies of slides. So let me do a very quick walkthrough of um, what, what our day looks like and what to expect. So first, we're going to get grounded in Future Ready Oregon and the charter of the Manufacturing Industry Consortium. We'll have a brief introduction to the executive leadership team and hear their perspective on why this work matters. Then we're going to do some deep dives to get grounded in the data and to get grounded in the examples that we know what's already working in the two initial focus areas for this consortium. And those two focus areas uh, will be two working groups. One is integrating education and training responses. The other is expanding equity and diversity. So we're gonna have panels on each of those topics that will really ground us in what's working, you know, what, what are some ideas, some trends, some lessons learned, um, we will have lunch between those two panels. So 
I know I always like to know <laughs> when is lunch coming. Lunch will be between those two panels. So after um, one panel, we'll kind of give you guys a heads up to go grab lunch and then to come back. And you have about 15 minutes to make that transition. Um, and then after the panels, we're gonna move into interactive facilitated breakout sessions. Again, on those two um, topics that will lead into working groups. And so I believe that when you registered, you've all signed up for which group you're gonna be part of. And it's also listed on the membership list if you need a refresher. Um, we'll come back together to report out from those breakout sessions and have another kind of facilitated group discussion at that point, which will be um, led with by our um, executive leadership team and, and I'll help with the facilitation of that um, to discuss what we learned, where we're going. We'll wrap up with practical next steps. So that's where we're headed. I'm gonna turn it back to Jennifer um, for our first session. Are you using this one? I think so. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, I have the privilege of walking you through a little bit of our history and how we ended up here today. Uh, I do want to just acknowledge that today is probably going to feel like a lot of talking at you. There's a lot of foundational information that we want to make sure you all have um, kicking off this work so that we're all operating with the same, um, with the same information at hand. Uh, as Erin mentioned, we will have some time for breakout uh, discussions towards the second half of our time today. Um, and so there will be time for interacting with one another. We have a couple of transition breaks that will give you the opportunity to introduce yourself to each other. Um, but first we want to uh, walk you through um, a little bit about what is Future Ready Oregon and how the industry consortium fits into that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our purpose and our structure and our meeting cadence. And as Erin mentioned on the right hand side of your packet, there is a one pager um, uh, with a little bit of background and summary on Future Ready Oregon. That might be a good reference for you. Next slide, please. Um, so taking a step back and uh, Director Cannon mentioned this, I want, I want to talk a little bit about the origin of the Future Ready Oregon legislation. Of course, the disruption created by the pandemic exacerbated a workforce crisis and exposed significant disparities in how our systems serve Oregon's communities of color and other historically underserved and marginalized communities. And in early 2020, Governor Brown convened the Racial Justice Council to inform policy and budget priorities with a racial justice lens. And over the following year, workforce needs consistently emerged uh, as a priority across all policy areas. Heading into the 2022 legislative session, uh, Governor Brown convened a work group that included education, workforce, and community partners that um, helped to inform and develop a comprehensive workforce investment proposal. And it was in 2022 that the Oregon State Legislature passed Senate Bill 1545, providing a comprehensive $200 million investment in, um, to advance an equitable workforce system. Future Ready Oregon intentionally engages Oregon's historically underserved and underrepresented communities. And the investments are intended to advance education and training programs that lead to employment in key sectors of our economy, such as healthcare, manufacturing, and technology. Next slide, please. As we're implementing Future Ready Oregon investments, we're guided by several core principles. Uh, the investments must work together to impact the entire workforce pipeline, facilitating seamless career connected learning opportunities with a focus on recruitment retention and career advancement opportunities and decision making including funding including decisions around funding and policy and process must be grounded in racial justice and equity centered on serving the priority populations identified in the bill and advancing a diverse workforce these core principles really are the sustainable at the heart of the sustainability of the Future Ready Oregon investments over time. 
um, advancing meaningful and inclusive partnerships and collaboration like industry consortium that will redefine Oregon's workforce education and training system where employers and industry leaders are informing and identifying critical workforce needs and high value credentials and education and training partners are helping to develop curriculum and deliver on those high value credential opportunities and community based organizations with trusted relationships with priority populations are facilitating recruitment and retention strategies and identifying uh, wraparound supports and services. Next slide, please. The Higher Education Coordinating Commission, or the HEC, as you'll hear uh, referred to throughout the day, is responsible for administering a majority of the Future Ready Oregon investments, as well as providing for comprehensive assessment and reporting. The HEC is charged with the statewide coordination of post-secondary education policy and funding with responsibility across all sectors of higher education and workforce development in Oregon. And the HEC envisions a future in which all Oregonians benefit from the transformational power of high quality post-secondary education and training and envisions a future where an individual's community or characteristic is no longer a predictor of education and training outcomes. It's with this clearly defined focus that, um, uh, and, and the focus on coordination that the HEC through initiatives like Future Ready Oregon is advancing its strategic goals of affordability, equity, student access, and economic and community impact. Next slide, please. We recognize that significant disparities in how our systems serve Oregon's communities of color and other historically marginalized, marginalized communities. Um, and this includes access to and the successful completion of education and training programs. It's with this awareness and understanding that HEC applies its equity lens across all programs. And you all will have the opportunity to hear more about HEX Equity Lens and how it will uh, inform and provide foundation to our work going forward. Um, and our director uh, of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the HEC is with us today, Rudy Ann Rivera Lindstrom, and she will be uh, walking us through some of that at our, at our next meeting together. Um, Hex Equity Lens was adopted by our commission in 2014 and drives Hex processes, policies, and investments to advance an equitable post secondary education and training system and to emphasize historically underserved students and training participants with a particular focus on racial equity. Next slide, please. So, a little bit more about Future Ready Oregon. Um, as I mentioned, it's a $200 million package of investments that are really designed to work together to advance an equitable workforce system. And uh, we affectionately refer to this as our spider web slide, but it gives you a quick snapshot of each of the pieces of the puzzle. Um, I'm going to do a quick flyover, but generally the um, the investments in Future Ready Oregon fall in two categories. Uh, uh, grant making opportunities where we're investing in innovation and um, strategic initiatives like the industry consortia where we're really advancing um, this idea that co-creating workforce solutions um, will advance a more equitable workforce system. Um, a little bit about the grant making opportunities for Future Ready Oregon uh, to the top left, I guess that's about 10 or 11 o'clock for those who remember how to read a clock. Um, uh, Future Ready Oregon included $35 million in a, in a program called Prosperity 10,000. This funding provides um, uh, investment to the local workforce development boards to expand their capacity to provide career coaching services, develop paid training opportunities, as well as to provide scholarships, stipends, and wraparound supports. 
Uh, these investments are not specific to healthcare manufacturing and technology and really intended for the local workforce boards to advance opportunities that are regionally identified as priorities. And you'll be hearing more from the local workforce boards in meetings, uh, meetings to come about the work that they're doing around manufacturing and advanced manufacturing across the state. Um, next at 12 o'clock is a $14.9 million investment that uh, continued and expanded career pathways training programs at Oregon's 17 community colleges. These are programs that integrate education and training with wraparound supports for students and, uh, and again are not specific to healthcare manufacturing and technology and allowed uh, community colleges again to really invest in responding to regional workforce needs. The next investment uh, is $10 million that was made to advance the infrastructure at Oregon's community colleges and universities around credit for prior learning. Credit for prior learning allows Oregonians to receive credit for the knowledge and skills gained through work and life experience, such as military training, significant work experience, as well as through formal and informal education um, and training from institutions of higher education, both in the United States and in other countries. Um, next, uh, which is now at six o'clock, we're gonna jump to the bottom. I, I, I don't know if you noticed this, I'm having to look at the clock to remind <laughs> myself what is down. <laughs> um, the largest investment in Future Ready Oregon is $95 million in Workforce Ready grants. These are competitive grant opportunities that are intended to encourage innovation and broaden the partners that comprise our workforce system. And uh, grants are available to community-based and culturally specific organizations and education and training providers um, and can do several things, but primarily fund the creation or expansion of education and training programs in the key sectors of healthcare, manufacturing, and technology. Uh, funds can also be used to expand the capacity of organizations to provide workforce development services. This may be introducing workforce services to their portfolio. It may also be expanding into uh, one of those key sectors, healthcare, manufacturing, or technology. And you'll have the opportunity today to hear from some community-based organizations that have um, been awarded Workforce Ready Grant funding. Uh, to talk a little bit about how they're using those funds to advance a diverse workforce uh, in manufacturing specifically. Uh, lastly, workforce ready grant funding can be used to provide direct benefits to individuals participating in education or training programs that lead to meaningful jobs and careers in healthcare manufacturing and technology. And that can include um, offsetting the cost of tuition and fees. It can also use, be used to support students with those wraparound services. It may be offsetting the costs of transportation or housing or childcare. Some of those things that we're hearing from uh, education and training participants are barriers either to accessing education opportunities or to um, the successful completion of those. You'll see there is uh, a couple of other um, program elements that are administered by our partners at BOLI, the Bureau of Labor and Industries, and uh, the Youth Development Division at Oregon's Department of Education. Um, those investments focus on expanding registered apprenticeships and expanding opportunities for um, young people who are disconnected from the traditional education system. Uh, but the remainder of the funding is administered by the Higher Education Coordinating Commission. A bit about uh, the investments that are in strategic initiatives intended to inform an equitable workforce system. Um, first, I'll mention at eight o'clock, the Workforce Benefits Navigator Program. Um, this funding is intended to establish a network of workforce benefits navigators to be located in WorkSource Oregon one-stop centers and at community-based organizations across the state to provide a single point of contact that can efficiently help individuals navigate 
the resources that are available to them, either connecting them to education and training opportunities or connecting education and training participants to the supports that they need to be successful. And then of course, the industry consortia, why we're here today. Um, we are launching three industry consortia in each of those key sectors, one in healthcare, one in technology, and today in manufacturing. We're gonna talk a little bit more about those in a moment, but at the heart, industry consortia are designed to build partnerships that more deeply engage employers, education and training partners and community-based organizations in co-creating workforce solutions that will grow and diversify the manufacturing workforce in Oregon. And um, before we uh, take a closer look at your role and responsibilities as consortium members, I do wanna mention Hex, a bit about HEC's role in assessment and accountability for the Future Ready Oregon investments. Next slide, please. So our plan for assessment and reporting centers around two intertwined questions that really guide all of our reporting and data collection throughout implementation of Future Ready Oregon. First, does Future Ready Oregon lead to greater economic security? And second, does Future Ready Oregon lead to greater equity, especially racial equity? Our analysis will examine access to funding and workforce training opportunities. We'll also ask how the investment is being put into practice. We wanna learn from grantees a bit more about process and, um, and barriers to opportunities and process. And finally, we plan to examine outcomes to really understand the economic impacts and the equity impacts of the Future Ready Oregon investments. All right, next slide, please. I'm gonna move us through a bit more about the industry consortia. As I mentioned, industry consortia are really intended to be a forum for building partnerships and collaboration. And you had the opportunity to meet Erin. She'll be facilitating uh, much of our discussion here today. And Erin and her colleague, Lindsay, um, came on board with the HEC uh, probably a year ago to really start um, creating a framework for what the industry consortia could be. And uh, as I mentioned, we launched uh, healthcare in April, we launched technology in June, and we're here today launching manufacturing. And it's just been really exciting to see the possibilities that um, we're creating through this shared leadership approach. Next slide, please. So a little bit about your purpose. Um, the industry consortia will provide a forum for consistent employer engagement, really for all of us to better understand business needs and industry trends around uh, manufacturing and advanced manufacturing in Oregon. This will also be a place where industry leaders and public partners can share ideas and collaborate on some of the more complex workforce challenges that are impeding economic opportunity. And it's also a place for us to intentionally integrate Oregon's economic uh, strategies with our talent development systems. And I'm gonna keep us moving and go ahead and go to the next slide. You've heard a little bit from Aaron and Turner about the roles of the um, Sparks Policy Group and Oregon Consensus. As I mentioned, we have a number of members of HEX Future Ready Oregon team here today as well. And um, I wanna take this moment to introduce you to your executive leadership team. They are identified in your charter, um, but at I guess that's the head of the table. Um, we have Ed Fazer, provost from Oregon State University, Jonas Cologne, deputy director for Centro Cultural de Washington County, Mariah Robbins, vice president for global people and operations here at ADEC, and Scott Bruin, vice president for government affairs at Oregon Business and Industry. And um, that you're going to hear from them momentarily about why they're excited to provide leadership to the space. But 
the intention around this executive leadership team, as you can see, is again, to provide that shared leadership model where they'll be um, really helping to facilitate uh, uh, diverse perspectives um, in our work together. They're responsible for acting as subject matter experts and innovative thinkers and providers of practical guidance that will really help HEC staff to advance specific deliverables and working group outcomes. And uh, we'll be stewards of that process uh, with you all as we work together. As consortium members, uh, you will be responsible for understanding and assessing the statewide manufacturing workforce needs, uh, as well as skill standards and career pathways. You'll be making strategic policy and funding recommendations to address gaps and opportunities. And these recommendations will be informed by the work of working groups. And as Aaron mentioned, uh, we'll be kicking off the work of two working groups here today, integrating education and training responses to workforce needs. And secondly, expanding equity and diversity and really better understanding opportunities to advance equity and diversity in education and employment. We also have the opportunity to stand up agile working groups as you all determine what your information needs are to, um, to keep your work moving forward. Next slide, please. A little bit about timeline and outcomes. Um, I know Aaron mentioned this um, short-term focus and longer-term or persistent focus to put a finer point on that in the short term, which will be uh, now through the end of the year, probably early 2024, the consortia will be working to inform uh, the next round of uh, future ready Oregon funding opportunities. So specifically workforce ready grant opportunities that will focus on advancing a diverse workforce in manufacturing. Um, and uh, in the longer term and persistent, so 2024 and beyond, the legislation uh, establishes the consortium as advisory to the state's workforce and talent development board. We have a number of uh, workforce and talent development board members with us uh, today and serving on your counterpart consortia in healthcare and uh, technology. And, um, and your work going forward will continue to inform uh, strategic policy and funding recommendations to address gaps and opportunities in advancing a diverse manufacturing workforce in Oregon. Um, following today's kickoff meeting, we expect that the consortium will begin a quarterly cadence. Uh, I anticipate that you will meet again in October and then we'll be on a quarterly cadence from there. Um, this is not quarterly, uh, if you can do math, but uh, we do expect there's a bit of compression um, to meet those short-term objectives. So we'll do our best to keep you uh, on a quarterly cadence, but we'll likely meet in uh, early October and early December to avoid the holidays and avoid getting too far behind in our work. Um, in the interim, working groups will meet to keep that work moving forward and again to respond to the information needs of the broader consortium. Next slide, please. So as you work towards the first set of recommendations, I do just want to note that Future Ready Oregon um, strategically combined state general fund investments with federal ARPA um, investments. The general fund investments were made in the balance of the 21-23 biennium and we're in the process of closing out those grant opportunities uh, that had to be spent by June 30th of this year. So you'll see on the left, these are some of the grant funding programs that I spoke about earlier. Those funds have been fully obligated and we are now shifting into informing our federal ARPA funded investments, which again, as you can see, the largest opportunity will be in the workforce ready grants, which are intended to advance opportunities in healthcare, technology, and manufacturing. American Rescue Plan Act funding has to be obligated by the end of 2024 and spent by the end of 2026. 
So that's part of what's driving our short term timeline is reaching an initial set of recommendations that allow us then to provide a competitive grant opportunity and get uh, those funds under contract by the end of 2024. You'll hear a little bit more uh, today about some of the programs that have received funding through Workforce Ready Grants um, to date. And the next time we meet, we intend to expand on that and really put a finer point on what can and can't be funded through Workforce Ready Grants and what are the criteria that are established in the statute versus criteria and priorities that you all will have the flexibility to inform. All right, with that, I, um, I do want to take a moment to turn it over to our executive leadership team to give them the opportunity to share a little bit about why they're excited to be um, helping to lead this work and uh, kicking off this work here today. And I think I need to pass the good mic. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Scott Rowe, and I'm the director of uh, tax, fiscal, and manufacturing policy for OBI, Oregon Business Ministry. Uh, for those that don't know, OBI is the state's largest business trade association. We are also the state affiliate of the National Association of Manufacturers. We have about 1,600 members uh, that employ almost 300,000 Oregonians, and of those 1,600 members, approximately 20% of our membership are manufacturing companies which is kind of equivalent to what the state is about 20% of the, uh, uh, excuse me, about 30% of the state GDP is, uh, is, is, related, is, is manufacturing related. Um, so we're delighted to be here. Uh, you know, one of the things that we did back in 21 is work with Eco Northwest on the study of manufacturing in Oregon. And what we learned was, was super important, won't surprise anybody, but super important, which is just how big and how important the manufacturing industry is in Oregon and how diverse. I mean, everything from wood products to services, everything, to dental equipment, everything in between. Fantastic and diverse array of manufacturing goes on in Oregon. Um, it creates about, at least back in 21, about 215,000 jobs in Oregon are manufacturing related. Um, and one of the things we learned from that study too, which is really important, is that a 10% increase in manufacturing output in the state, which is normally about four years of growth, we'd like to accelerate that. But a 10% increase results in about almost a billion, a little uh, more than $800 million in new state revenues uh, to be used for everything from education and everything else. So critically important. Uh, one of the things and one of the reasons we're excited about the work uh, that, that's going on here is last summer, and Brad and ADEC were, were one of our hosts. Uh, last summer, we started a statewide bus tour. We went to over 25 manufacturers last August. We did the same thing this October, but last, last year in August. It was over 25 manufacturers across the state, all, all, city, all sectors, all parts of the state. And what we learned, you know, what we heard, some things weren't surprising. I mean, there were there was challenges in Oregon's tax structure and Oregon's regulatory structure. Uh, one of the things we heard again and again and again is the challenges with workforce. Um, it was certainly the, 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 the number of folks applying for jobs, um, uh, but it was, it was even bigger than that and, and issues that everybody's aware of in the workforce housing and, Childcare, especially in poor parts of the state, are just an impediment right now. Um, but uh, you know, we, we learned on that. Uh, you know, not surprised, but learned on that bus tour how important workforce issues are, how how critical that is to the to the success, future success of these businesses, and how frankly, you know, if we get the tax policies right, if we get the regulatory policies right, that's great. Uh, but but companies still can't perform and succeed without adequate workforce. And so that's what this is about. Uh, we're very interested in participating, and it is a large state investment, so we're very interested to make sure that it's, uh, it's done. You know, the fiduciary responsibility is, is done well. So, thank you. I was really hoping I was not going to have to call a stop today, but so <laughs> this is usually our rule when we testify. I get to go before you. So, um, so <laughs> I'm Mariah Robbins again. Um, I have a very unique role here at ADEC. I've been at the company for about a decade, um, and I get to have the opportunity to have both the people side of things. I have all of traditional HR. I also am the first woman leader at ADEC of all of manufacturing. So I have kind of both sides. I have to hire everybody and then I have to figure out how am I going to utilize that labor appropriately. So I get the whole um, from soup to nuts and it's a really great uh, opportunity for me. I've learned a lot about that uh, 
um, kind of transition of how workforce really is impacting manufacturing over the last couple of years. I must be a glutton for punishment. I took over manufacturing in the middle of the pandemic, so probably not the best timing on my part. Learned a lot about supply chain. Um, but what I really am excited about is really, um, when Jennifer had called, this is kind of a perfect marrying of all of my interests and all of the biggest problems that we have to solve in the state. I also did my doctorate in um, public affairs and policy, so thinking about how do you bring together all of these groups and really I've always had an interest in how we create bigger, better social capital and bring the right groups together because I really believe we can each make and we all are making incremental changes and improvements in the sector, but we can't transform unless we do it all together. And we are at a pivotal point where transforming manufacturing in the state of Oregon is all about how do we create the off right housing opportunities and childcare and the right training opportunities and excitement, but it also starts all the way at elementary school, keeping kids excited about manufacturing jobs and it's not something where you know it's all blue collar, it's not something where your job's going to get moved overseas, all of those things that we're kind of working against a marketing problem around manufacturing sector, as well as just an opportunity for us to think about how do we create the right training programs and create pathways all the way from middle school and high school that really lead to really high paying jobs and maybe are a different pathway from some traditional pathways in the state. So very excited. I think there's so much opportunity and I think we're going to do some great things together. So I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Okay, so I've got two tough people to follow. I'm in Phaser Provost, the Executive Vice President of Oregon State. Good to meet you all. Good to be here today. If you don't know what the spirit of word provost means. I am the Chief Academic Officer and the Chief Operating Officer of OSU, so the President says stand for that my hand. <laughs> um, uh, as I said, really delighted to be here. A couple of reasons. The goals of this program are really important. At OSU, we talk often about our inclusive excellence mission and what we mean by that. And what we mean is we don't want to be known for, for who we exclude, uh, which is a traditional model in higher ed. We want to be known by who you're able to include and, and help to be successful in your career and life. So, the core uh, values behind this program are very important to Oregon State. A couple other reasons why I'm excited about being part of this. The first is we know at OSU, being a university that's operating in all 36 counties, working with companies across a lot of different industries, farming, uh, ranching, forestry, uh, manufacturing, and, and IT sector, how important it is to have a robust economic and workforce development strategy in the state of Oregon. And our success depends on it as kind of institution we are looking to serve uh, communities and industry, uh, but it's essential to the success of all these uh, businesses and for widely shared prosperity in this state. So that's that's a big piece of this. I also think there's tremendous opportunity to innovate in education and training, and that's something we put a lot of emphasis on at OSU. You may know we have a, a very large online program now, almost 15,000 students studying at OSU exclusively online. We want to double that number over the next few principally to serve 39 million Americans out there who have some education and no degree and uh, limited options for moving successfully through the workforce. We just announced the creation of a new division called the Division of Educational Ventures that's focused around things like uh, alternative credentials, innovating in pathways to degrees, collaboration with community colleges, and of course our online delivery, which we're seeing more and more blending between online and on-site. Uh, we're also, there's another piece of this which goes beyond what OSU is trying to do to just feed the pipeline, which is to actually innovate the pipeline. And one of the reasons we've gotten very uh, excited about uh, Future Ready Oregon is that our expertise in online education is something that we think can be leveraged for the state as a whole. We have programs, for example, that we develop at OSU with our uh, learning science folks, which other institutions and community colleges then pick up that. Uh, curricula and those technologies and deliver it. So that's something that we can offer as an institution looking to innovate in this space. So lots we can do here where uh, we know we don't have all the answers, but we're glad to be part of, part of the solution with you all. And I guess I'm the one who's complaining. I can't follow all three of you. <laughs> so I'm Jonathan Colon, Deputy Director for Centro. Um, I come from the trenches. Um, we've been in the trenches years now and you know I thought this was easy we had someone who needed a job we talked to them for a few minutes and you know got them a job <laughs> you know 
take into account that we've been six, uh, three years in COVID. Um, so we've been in a very fortunate uh, position. To, um, our Center for Workforce was created um, through an investment of the uh, city of Hillsborough with enterprise dollars with the intention of supporting uh, those families that lived around uh, this enterprise. Um, so we were very targeted in who we were looking for. We knew we had barriers, um, but we really didn't realize the deep trenches that we were going into. Um, workforce is no longer about trying to get someone a job. Um, you know, there's infrastructure, um, there's housing, there's childcare. Um, and for us, there is also the new dynamic of what a family is and how the family will have to switch how they've thought about employment and employment in the house to react to what the system is actually asking. Um, and the attempt to support those uh, individuals, it, it has to be the entire family to make this work. Um, so it's a really interesting dynamic to be. Um, we, you're having to work with the five, six year old, the 14 year old, the 20 year old, the 40 year old parent um, who has the same opportunity to get that entry job as the 19 and 20 year old. And someone has to make a decision on who's going to be that. And I have to talk to the grandmother, whether here or home country or wherever it is, who's going to give the advice on what that direction is, right? So that reminds me why we're here. It's going to take a lot of people to solve this. And it's going to take a lot of different views um, and I'm fortunate to be at this particular table in a time where their table has been expanded in a way that has never been expanded before. Um, and that's why I'm here. I've been given the opportunity to step into a table um, that has expanded its view on who needs to be at the table to attempt to get us out of this. Um, apparently this is an art and not science. Um, so I guess we'll figure it out together, but it's nice to know that it's gonna take all of us and all our expertise um, with the different views to move us through this. So this is why I'm here and I'm very grateful. Thank you. I'm going to grab your mic and come back. And if you all remember, when I was opening, I said, there's three things that make these um, you know, consortia successful. One of them is a strong leadership team. That is it. You guys are fantastic. Um, love your reactions and your responses. I think you're, you're really setting a great vision for us for, for today and going forward. So now um, we're going to take a few minutes to get grounded in the data. So I'm going to introduce Gail Krumenauer from um, the Oregon Employment Department. So this is a, a sort of ground us in what we need to know. What does the data tell us about the manufacturing workforce in Oregon, the workforce trends in Oregon? As you're listening to her present, can you please use your notepads to jot things down that stand out to you, that make you, you know, question, I want to know more about that, or I want to discuss this in the breakout group, because um, we are going to not have a lot of time for Q&A after her presentation, but we are going to be bringing everything we hear to the breakout sessions this afternoon, um, and we're going to be talking about what does this mean for our work? What does this mean for manufacturing for the people of Oregon? Um, and, and that's a couple of hours from now, so <laughs> go ahead and jot things down um, so we can come back to that. And, and I will hand you the microphone. Oh. Hey, maybe I do get to me a little bit. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Apologies for my voice. I actually, um, Newburgh's been kind of like my second home. Uh, I spend most of my Sundays here uh, coaching softball which will be reflected in a little bit of the graveliness of my voice today. So apologies for that. Um, but it's so it's great. It's great to be with you all today in my official professional capacity as the state employment economist at the Oregon Employment Department. I've been with the research division there for, uh, it'll be 14 years next month. And um, so I'm happy to talk a little bit about the trends we're seeing overall in manufacturing in Oregon um, and also touch on difficulty finding workers. Uh, so as we switch into the next slide, I'm going to start us off with um, just some broad context. Uh, first, looking at the labor market, um, the, the employment, unemployment side of things, and then we'll switch to the job side and target it on manufacturing after that. So just kind of broadly, uh, Oregon's unemployment rate was 3.4% in July. That matches its record low going back to 1976 at least. Uh, and 
So what you're looking at here is um, a graph that shows our unemployment rate and the United States, the US unemployment rate. Um, they're relatively close. Typically ours is higher, but we're almost the same as the US as of July. Um, even though, uh, so there's only been a few periods in the past several decades where we've seen unemployment this low, uh, just for a couple of months in the mid 1990s, uh, for a few years leading up to the pandemic recession and now. Um, one of the side effects of low unemployment, which I mentioned we'll get to um, closer to the end, is difficulty finding enough workers for all the job openings that are out there. Um, so we will talk about that shortly, but I just wanted to note right here that um, the way it's running in Oregon and in the US right now is that there's one unemployed person for every just private sector only in Oregon job vacancy out there. So conceptually, if every single unemployed person was a perfect geographical and you know skills interest match to every single job opening that was out there, like ooh, problem solved, right? That's not how it works on the ground. You all know that. But um, so it's the the when we see we're in recessionary conditions, it's not atypical to see you know five or six unemployed workers per job opening, right? And a one to one ratio. And actually for significant portions of 2021, there were more job openings than unemployed people in every single area of Oregon, every broad region. Um, that's really difficult for employers. And that's one of the, the um, offshoots of having very low unemployment. Uh, next slide. This graphic is super dense. I'm not gonna expect everybody to take in every single point of it. The, the kind of broad look here is to see that um, this is Oregon and all the 36 counties. Um, and at a county level, we only have data that goes back to 1990. So you're gonna see a bottom bar, a top bar, that's the lowest ever and highest ever unemployment rates in each of Oregon's counties since 1990. Uh, and then that dot is where unemployment is as of July of 2023. And the point is, it's not just one county or one area or urban areas that are having low unemployment. We're seeing unemployment rates at or near the record lows all across the state. All right, so next slide. Um, so all that sounds really great, right? Low unemployment, low unemployment rates, low unemployment rates everywhere, um, but it's not, it's not that clean. Um, what we're looking at here is Oregon's labor force participation rate, and that's the share of those who are 16 and older in the state who are either working, um, that could be self-employed, working for a payroll employer, living in Oregon, but working in a job in Washington or remotely for somewhere else, Anyway, so that's anybody 16 plus who's employed or they're not employed, but they have been actively looking for a job and are available and able to take one in the past four weeks. So that rate was at 61.8% in July. Um, coming out of the pandemic recession, we saw this really strong bounce back in labor force participation. Uh, and it actually got up to you know, the highest it had been since 2012. So really strong bounce back. And now we've seen that that's kind of turned. We're seeing labor force participation decline. Um, and we're actually seeing since uh, the last peak in the size of the labor force, which is about 2.1 million people, uh, that happened in January of this year. And it's declined by about 38,000 since then. So that's a 1.7% decline. And again, on the scale of 2.1 million, that's not huge. But that's something to keep an eye on because you know we're starting to see retirements tick up again. One out of four workers in Oregon is at least 55 years old. Um, and so uh, it, this is a trend that I'm keeping an eye on. It's not um, at a dramatic scale yet, but that's moving in a different direction than I would like to see it. Um, next slide. Okay, switching to, um, so our monthly and most current employment is um, total non-farm payroll employment. Um, and I feel like I have to point that out after all the farm equipment I was driving behind this morning to get here. Um, that, um, so this is non-farm payroll employment. So employers that have folks on their payrolls are wire counted in these. Um, again, we get to start with the good stuff, which is really where I like to be, which is that total non-farm payroll employment in Oregon is at the highest it's ever been. Oregon has more jobs than we did before the pandemic recession. Uh, and we're seeing, um, we're seeing that even though growth has slowed um, a little bit this year compared to previous years, which makes sense. We were in a rapid recovery from a recession for a couple of years. We are still seeing an upward trend of job growth overall. Um, next slide. Again, I um, just want to be 
mindful of the geographic layout, even though we've got all those jobs back and we're now in a jobs expansion, that doesn't mean all those jobs came back where they were lost, right? So taking a geographical breakout look um, of how the recovery has come in different parts of Oregon. So about half of Oregon's counties also have more jobs now than they did before the pandemic recession. Uh, and we're seeing uh, a little bit more of a lag um, in that recovery in Multnomah County, Lane County, and in parts of Southern and Eastern Oregon. Uh, switching to next slide. I uh, also wanted to do kind of an industry breakout. Um, one of the things that's happened, and, and I referenced this a few minutes ago, is that for a couple of years, you know, the, the latter part of 2020, uh, most of 2021, and into 2022, we were kind of in this, um, for, you know, for all of us really kind of great space where we were recovering, adding jobs, you know, we weren't coming out of a great space, a recession, a bad one. But um, all broad sectors of the economy were recovering. Everybody's adding jobs. This graph was all green bars, which is everybody's adding jobs. Um, we really hit this point uh, over the past several months where there is a distinctive split between industries that have added jobs over the past month and broad sectors of the economy that have not. Um, and I do want to note where manufacturing is on that list, which is having lost 3,000 jobs over the past year in Oregon. Um, we'll dive into that a little bit more. Um, also, I wanted to kind of note, um, taking a look at, um, it was before that we had seen, it was really higher paying industries that had that were adding jobs compared um, to like lagging. And now we're kind of seeing a real, just kind of mix in terms of what's happening um, along the pay scale in job growth and decline over the year as well. Um, oh, I did want to talk about, since we're in Yamhill County too, um, total non-farm employment overall um, has been stable over the year in Yamhill County. I don't get more detailed than Yamhill County uh, for monthly data, uh, but it's a, there's been a change to the addition of 100 jobs over the past year um, and manufacturing um, has also declined in Yamhill County over the past year by about 300 jobs. To the next slide. Um, again, just kind of looking at the longer trend of manufacturing, we're gonna start at the top level, then break it down into its two biggest parts and then get a little more detailed. Uh, it is remarkable to me that manufacturing, even though it has not reached 100% of the jobs it had in February, 2020, how rapidly and how strongly it has recovered. Um, because if you kind of look over the course of time, uh, you know, at least since the 1990s, anytime there's a recession, manufacturing has not historically recovered to where it was before any of the past few recessions. Uh, so to see as strong and as rapid of gains as we have seen um, has been different. Um, it's, it's not a full recovery, but it's a stronger recovery than we've seen um, over the past few recessions. Um, again, though, it's troubling to me to see that decline in recent months. Uh, and as we switch over to the next slide, um, so underneath manufacturing, there's like the two biggest categories are durable goods, things that are meant to last for more than a few years, that's your maker washing machine, and non-durable goods, which are things that are not meant to last um, for a few, so that so durable goods, you know, like computer electronic manufacturing type stuff, wood products, non-durable goods, be things like food manufacturing, stuff like that. Um, so if you look on the left here, um, so durable goods manufacturing, a little more than 130,000 jobs in Oregon. So very big, um, really good paying jobs in general. Um, the trend looks really similar to the overall one we just saw on the side before with manufacturing, right? Durable, non-durable goods, pardon me, on the right side uh, has been more stable over the past year, but at lower than it's below pre-pandemic levels. So those are kind of the two broad differing trends that are happening um, in the two big sections, durable, non-durable of manufacturing. Uh, and then as we switch over to the next slide, we'll go one layer deeper and take a look at, um, at, a, at a more detailed level where the gains and losses have occurred. So much like the overall economy where I'm talking about some sectors of the economy have added jobs over the past 12 months and some have not, the picture is similar when we're looking at manufacturing where we've seen the addition of 1,100 jobs over the past year in food manufacturing, but we're seeing declines um, over the past year in wood products, computer and electronic products, um, which includes semiconductor uh, manufacturing um, and then fabricated metals as well. And then machinery is level over the year. 
All right. And as we move to our next slide, um, even though we've seen some weakness in manufacturing employment over the past year, uh, hiring demand remains really strong. Uh, and this is another space where manufacturing is really uh, mirroring kind of the overall trend. So overall, at any given time between April and June of 2023, so this spring, uh, Oregon's private employers had about uh, 69,000 job openings. Uh, and that's, again, just private employers. Um, so that's down quite a bit um, from, you know, we were at 100,000 job vacancies at any given time for about a year and a half, which was extraordinarily high. Prior to 2020, the largest number of job vacancies we'd ever seen in the private sector was 67,000 in the summer of 2017. So it's still really high um, compared to, to kind of historically what we would expect. And this is looked specifically at manufacturing, at job vacancies in manufacturing, um, which is still running pretty high, mirroring that trend that's down from those big peaks, you know, hit 12,000 at one point um, and stayed up around 10,000 through much of 2021. Um, so we're down from that at about 7,000, but still, if you kind of take a look in this pre-2020 period, that's a relatively high number of job openings. Um, and one of the other things that I kind of wanted to close with, I was taking a look at, this is our own job vacancy survey. So the employment department, and if you've ever gotten this filled out, thank you, this is how I can share this stuff. Um, we send out uh, about 16,000 surveys to private employers every year, and we ask them, uh, what positions are you actively recruiting for? Uh, what's the job title? And then people are gracious and awesome enough to tell us what the starting wage that's offered is, what education is required, what experience is required, and then we can really take a look at that and get, and, and there's an open-ended response for if this position is difficult to fill, what's the primary reason why? Um, and we get really rich information off of this. Um, we're one of only, I think, three states that do it. Um, so it's, it's incredibly um, helpful to us. And one of the things I took a look at, and one of the things that's been an interesting trend is, you know, when we see kind of these longer stretches of low unemployment, um, we see average wages tend to rise because employers are battling each other for the limited available labor force that's out there, right? Um, and so I looked at um, the spring 2023 data and uh, the average starting wage for job opening in manufacturing in Oregon was $24 an hour. And then one of the things we've seen is that as, as different sectors of Oregon's economy were reopening at different um, paces and in different ways, um, even back a couple of years ago, and some of this has like persisted now for a couple of years, um, we saw that like retail trade and transportation warehousing, they raised their average wages before other places like food and hospitality did. And so I went and looked, um, and just as a comparison, so the average starting wage for a retail trade job was $23.90 an hour in Oregon. And um, then kind of look at the difference in thinking about um, how employers compete for talent, looking at the differences in education required beyond high school, previous experience required, those things that are extras that someone has to do to be able to qualify for a job that's out there. Um, and just in comparing those two, obviously some people have different demographics, different interests, some things are gonna give you a completely different career trajectory and I would tell anybody that. Um, but a lot of people think in the now or using the now and I think it's like you were talking about earlier, um, really wise of us to talk about, you know, from early on all the way through, like, what does this mean for you for the entirety of your life and for the entirety of your career all the way through adulthood, right? Um, but some people are making those quicker trade-offs, right, about like, what can I get now and how does that compare now? And um, education um, beyond high school that was required for about one out of four manufacturing jobs, typically overall um, in the economy, it's about um, three out of 10, so about 24%. Uh, and it goes usually between six and seven out of 10 require previous experience. Um, so that's relatively high, especially in a time when it's so hard to find people. Um, having a large share of um, jobs that require previous experience, which for safety reasons, and this is true in construction and manufacturing, certainly in healthcare settings as well, sometimes that's really necessary. Um, but anytime employers can um, like reduce those barriers it, and any other barriers that aren't that's like inherent to the nature of the work, it helps create the opportunity for more people to be available for job openings in a really way that they need. So I'll close with that. And if anybody has any questions.
sorry, hopefully that wasn't too loud. Yes. Okay, so if you have questions, we're going to get to those. Oh, Ryan has a question. We're going to oh, tackle those in sorry, the breakout okay. session. No, 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 oh, we okay. started a little late. So um, we are going to try to keep on track and move into our next panel. So folks want to, on the panel, want to come up? Oh, you just moved up. There she is. Okay, <laughs> so um, Gail is going to be here for our working group sessions. And so we can pull her in and hear our questions for her based on this information. Um, but do want to keep moving. So we have now coming up um, a, a panel that's really going to focus on um, on the ground partnership, Hillsborough Advanced Manufacturing Workforce Partnership. Um, that's really going to help us think about, talk about what's working, um, specifically in integrating education and training responses. So again, really setting us up for a robust discussion when we get to that working session and I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. All right, thank you. As the panelists are coming forward, we are going to have to share the microphone. Um, so I'm going to give uh, each of the panelists a moment to introduce themselves, but really this is an opportunity for you to hear from a local or regional partnership where um, they've invested in uh, this shared leadership model. There you go, Travis. Put your name card right out there. <laughs> um, uh, really invested in this shared leadership model that we've been talking about all morning, um, and uh, and and talk a little bit about from uh, the education and industry perspective and community partnership perspective um, how they have. Uh, launched the Hillsborough Advanced Manufacturing Workforce Partnership and uh, what lessons they've been learning along the way. So if you could just take a moment and each of you introduce yourselves and the organization that you're representing, and then maybe um, after quick introductions, Christy, you can tell us a little bit about um, the Hillsborough Advanced Manufacturing Workforce Partnership and the partners and goals and objectives. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Um, Travis Ryman, superintendent of the Hillsborough School District, uh, fourth largest school district in the state. We have about 19,000 students. About 41% of our students identify as Latino and 39% as white. We have a really diverse school district beyond that bicultural um, community that I represent. Um, we started uh, CTE programs years ago, but in the last, I'd say, decade, we've really doubled down showing students that pathways include university but don't always require it and therefore we're trying to match our educational program with the industry and make sure that our students have access to all the opportunities that are out there. We're lucky to live in a community that has a ton of high-tech advanced manufacturing uh, going on in our backyard and we believe every student has should have the opportunity to access that and we believe that industry will depend on our students to be able to thrive so we don't see ourselves as a charity case but as leaders and workers. Hi, uh, my name is Christy Wilson, and I'm the Workforce Development Manager for the City of Hillsboro. Um, I've been there for a couple decades, um, kind of starting and working with the K-12 district and finding pathways in the public sector for um, students. And then now my, my job now is in economic development, um, looking at external work private companies, as Travis said, we have a, a strong manufacturing uh, community in Hillsboro, so really kind of working to kind of pull all the different pieces of the puzzle together with industry, community-based organizations, K-12, uh, and education partners to really build the systems um, that work for the community to find um, local wage jobs in their backyard. Hi there, everyone. I'm Carrie Michael Dalflame, and I'm the Dean for Megatronics, Electronics, and Advanced Manufacturing Technologies at Portland Community College. I've been at the college for about nine years. We're the largest community college in the state, and our CTE programs are spread throughout our entire district. Our district's the size of the city of Rhode Island, and um, in my role, I actually support uh, all the advanced manufacturing programs. So, um, really excited to be a part of this group. Thank you. And last, 
Um, Kathy Bishop, I'm with Gyrus Semiconductor and Human Resources. Uh, fortunate enough to be part of this, uh, for, I don't know, six years um, where we came together to really help pipeline and training. Um, again, our company, we're about 600 employees. We're a fab located in Hillsborough, not the big fab, we're the little one. Uh, so, you know, it, it's been a great ride and uh, appreciate it. So uh, the Hillsboro Advanced Manufacturing Workforce Partnership, HAMWIP, uh, if you've heard the acronym, uh, is a, a group of about 50 industry partners, all the way from the big one to the medium and the small ones um, that meet monthly along with our community-based organization, K-12, which is just such a key player in this space. Um, and then the higher ed, so Portland Community College and, and OSU and others participate as well. So essentially we meet once a month to talk about what the current workforce needs are. And as you all know, over the last six years, it's you know gone up and down and in different directions. But in 2019, we got together and created a really robust short-term and long-term workforce strategy all around holistic approach, advocacy and awareness, and pipeline. And we kind of identified that, you know, as a collective group, what our priorities are and what would be achievable, both again, short term, long term. And then a few months later, Future Ready Oregon dropped. And uh, the timing was beautiful because then all of a sudden, like now we have resources to move some of this work forward. So over the last uh, year, we, we applied and received a workforce readiness grant with Workforce Oregon or with um, Future Ready Oregon, and we've been doing all kinds of things. Um, kind of that capacity building to help us continue to kind of build that infrastructure that we can build on um, collectively. So um, one of the cool things that we're really working, I know someone mentioned this, is just the advocacy and awareness of the semiconductor and advanced manufacturing um, in the K-12 system and how it's, it's kind of like invisible, right? So like, do school to career counselors understand this field? And are they able to explain it to students and families? And how are we gonna kind of change the perception of the manufacturing, which Hillsboro is, again, with Intel, Gyra, and others there. Um, these are things that are there, but the community just needs, they're just buildings, right? So what, how, how do you access these jobs or, and show these jobs? Um, so we're spending a lot of time um, on that right now, and we're rolling out a campaign called Hillsboro Makes, which we're really excited. Um, in part of that, we also um, launched like what is Oregon's first of its kind registered youth apprenticeship in manufacturing, which I know here in Newburgh, um, ARE Manufacturing, we visited about five years ago and they were doing the things and we were like, we wanna do the things. So, you know, working with companies like Jaira that was able, were able to take kind of a risk um, to you know, change the policies around how do you get 16 year olds on the manufacturing floor? How do you work with educators to design schedules so that students can access those jobs during the school day? All of those things. So we, you know, by that kind of each of us has a piece of, of all the work that we do, which is um, just amazing. Our group is, uh, is able to do a lot of things because we're all dedicated. Um, we build um, sustainable programming, but we're also agile and we have to flip to look at working with PCC on on-the-job training or customized training, we can pivot that direction. So we just we have all the, the players at the table and um, everyone's active and engaging and yeah, we get to do a lot of cool stuff together. Um, so I'm hoping each of you can talk a little bit about um, what the key components to a successful partnership are, and maybe think specifically about what strengths, assets, or capabilities each um, of the partners bring to the partnership that would otherwise be left out if that partner wasn't at the table. I have a concrete example to share um, in answer to that question. One of the most rewarding activities that I was a part of when we were developing our apprenticeship program so that students in high school could access apprenticeship and get certified as manufacturing techs was a, a matrix of skills that we had gotten from 
um, the national model for Certified production technician. We listed out these skills and we were on a Zoom. This is deep in the pandemic. So we had folks like Kathy and Carrie in the in the Zoom. And I would read out a skill, like turn a screwdriver. And the industry partners would say, yep, or nope, or maybe. And then I'd say, work well in a team. And they'd say, yep, nope, or maybe. And I went through the list of all the skills that were both professional skills and hard technical skills and our industry partners gave me as a school guy the feedback about what skills were pertinent to the their employees that they were seeking and so I felt like that's an example of partnership where if our industry partners had not been at the table our curriculum would have come up short of their expectations and if our industry partners and higher ed partners are at the table we are able to create a curriculum that seamlessly uh, pathways students into those job opportunities. And we can replicate that activity in any um, sector or for any occupation. I think if we if we listen at school folks. Um, I think that's really great. One of the strengths uh, in Hillsboro specifically is I don't think in in local government, at least at the city level, there's generally like a dedicated workforce person. Um, so I think creating this position was really integral to um, being the convener because you kind of need someone that can bring everyone together, understand what that ROI is for everyone, and just make sure that you're having touch points so that everyone feels like they're getting value to take time to you know participate. So I'm always kind of just behind the scenes running around and and making sure everyone's happy and planning the next meeting, trying to figure out the topics that would you know, resonate with everybody. Um, so I think just with resources, being, being, being able to have this type of role is super important or partners screen maybe with your, your workforce board or, or someone else that's doing this work. Um, so I think that was, and I'll give you one example of uh, the apprentice, we'll go back to the apprenticeship program. <laughs> Um, so like, so Claudia Rizzo over there is our uh, apprenticeship coordinator. She's a queen and uh, I refer to her as a unicorn. So she's like industry, CTE, educated, everything in one package. Um, but like the city is funding her position with ARPA dollars. She's uh, employee record with Ken, Ken Madden, but she's housed at the school district. So during the pandemic, she wasn't pulled to like serve lunch or be a school counselor or teach seventh grade history, she was able to still be dedicated to, to her role. So just kind of figuring out, like that's an example of, again, when we're sitting down together, we're like, okay, what are the barriers? How do we remove them? And, and uh, that's one example of that. Again, everyone, um, I think that part of the success of this group is sh everybody shows up. People keep coming back and uh, keep recommitting, I would say, to this laser focused mission of really bringing shared prosperity to our region and state. And I know for me, working at PCC, it's such a gift, really, I would say, to get to attend these meetings and sit in the room with leaders from workforce, workforce development, the CEOs and um, the schools, because we're able to talk about things in a way that we're looking at the issues, but we're also creating solutions at the same time. And it's who's at the table that really matters. There's, as was said about this group, it's really important to have the right people at the table and then also be constantly asking who's not here and then having the flexibility to add people. So like an example, and we're digging into it slowly but surely, is that we were supported by um, Suzanne Bonamici to get a federal earmark for $910,000. The purpose of this funding is to increase the visibility of advanced manufacturing jobs in our communities with our community-based organizations, the families, everybody's personal board of directors, like really helping folks to um, envision themselves in advanced manufacturing in our state. And so this group provides a body to serve as a board of advisors on how to best leverage that funding in equitable ways to really uh, show results in terms of our 
work for a full time in the training that will help people advance uh, to the different levels of career throughout their whole life of learning and working and growing. So it's a wonderful organ, it's a wonderful group, and it's the right people at the table at the right time to achieve results. For us, um, our company purchased uh, our fab in about 11 years ago, and it was a floundering fab, about 280 employees that would have lost their jobs. And it was purchased with the belief that we could bring manufacturing back to the US. Um, I can't do that alone. So imagine being able to go to a group with other companies and you know, this is just a part of who's at the table. All these people that are so much smarter than I am, and I can throw in an idea and they go, oh yeah, we know who does that. And they bring them to the table. So we can get so much more done. And for companies that you know are smaller to be at that table and also let the school and the city know what reality is from an industry standpoint, you know, they may be going in a direction where you're going, we don't need that. Right. And then keep us on track. I know Travis is one of the main reasons the youth apprenticeship program happened. There were a couple of meetings there where we were kind of getting off. He's like, no, 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 that wasn't what we were doing. And he got us back on track. So all those strengths that come to the table are it's the combination, right? That's always uh, tough to prove in your doors the value, right? Um, but, you know, like I said, it's that combination of being able to get together. So in manufacturing, I think we all realized over the last 10 years, no one was coming right out of high school into manufacturing. It went away. But you walk around, you talk to all your employees, and what do you hear? Well, I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I got a job, and 40 years later, you know, I'm running the company, or I'm retiring, and I had great benefits and supported my family. You weren't hearing those stories. They were stopping. So, you know, what, what happened in, for industry to get involved in this and see that we can start bringing that back, um, it's about numbers. So we were able to uh, increase our youth population. Um, I think we increased over 30% just in the time that we were working with Hamwick. Um, we also are known in the schools. We're known to some of the people in a meeting where if I would have said gyro semiconductor in a meeting this size, you probably would have saw one hand go up. Maybe now we have five. So, you know, we're increasing that visibility for our company, but also for the industry as a whole. And, you know, you can't do that alone. That's impossible. Um, I don't care how many job fairs I go to, how many times I go to the high school, but when we go together and do all of these things, our visibility is there. Uh, so the next question is for Barry and Travis. Travis, you provided a great example, but is there more that you can tell us about the importance of ensuring alignment across education strategies? and um, the education and training continuum? I think so. The, um, I saw a graphic one time that the distribution of jobs in the United States right now, if you were to take 10 jobs, they cut up seven, two, and one. For every 10 jobs, one requires an advanced degree. Two jobs require some sort of community college or a undergraduate degree and seven jobs require something like training after high school or in high school. And so one thing that worries me as a public educator is, does our school system map onto an economy that needs that distribution of degrees? And one of the things that I would say to that question is, we should attend to the industries that are for real in our communities and in our state and decide what are the pathways to those occupations at the entry level and what are the stepping stones to the next ones and then map our educational programming so that I can achieve 
something in high school would have worked. Achieve the next step by going to college. Maybe my firm would pay for me to advance my education and then figure out how our, our at the end of the day, our students have access to that economy. And that'll create thriving communities and thriving industries that we're going to be tie ourselves together. And that happens through the communication that's happening here. So. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so at, at Portland Community College, I represent um, our academic programs that come from every background. We also, I also collaborate deeply and we're really robust workforce development department too at CCC, which is also well represented in this group and key partners in this group. And that we're, we're looking to tie it all together too um, from our workforce development program and short term, a couple of weeks for the start up to um, you know a short-term certificate uh, these different trainings are helping to pave that pathway hopefully aligning with people's ability to work while they're in school if they wish most of our students do work while they're in school um, and then what we're trying to do is really look critically at how those workforce development programs both encourage folks to continue on and actually do seamlessly perspective so um, yeah it's it's really about building that pathway for the students in our community of all ages that can help people to map out the jobs as they correspond to the educational opportunities all the way through to where we offer incumbent worker training so folks can continue to grow their workforce and promote from within which is great practice for the Um, what is unique about Hamlet's approach? What challenges have you faced and what lessons have you learned that you can share with the work that you do? But I, I think Hamlet does ham with or ham wig. I, I can never, yeah, I like whip actually, ham with. Um, I think it's, an, it's, it's finding the balance between workforce and jobs and community and also I not for nothing like this is hard work and it takes a lot of commitment and I do think that Hamwig has done a great job of bringing people together and building community it's one thing to have a group it's another thing to have a group that feels like a community of committed folks all working together to achieve our shared goals and I would say that that's that community feeling of this group is an intangible um, that I think it's important to recognize and I think it's a, a sum of all the parts really of the folks who are involved. And the lessons I've learned is that it's, it takes a committed group of like-minded people to transform things and make transformative change. Um, you know, it, it's unique just by who's at the table. Uh, every time we have a meeting, we have representatives across the board from, you know, the schools, the city, the county, uh, you know, education, different industry. And industry is probably the challenge because they come and go. Um, it, it's, you know, for most people, it's not in industry. It's not part of your job when you're a small company to be attending meeting so the time it takes it's you know hard to keep them coming so you got to keep them interested and I think that's what's you know unique is we've been able to do that because there's results if we didn't have the results they wouldn't come back so you know that's what this group has been able to do and that's because of having the right partners at the table um, I guess yeah lessons is, um, I don't know, be willing to take risks and, and be innovative. I know when I started convening the group in 2017, I did not have any idea what a semiconductor was. I still really do, honestly. So, <laughs> but you don't have to, I don't, I don't need to know that, right? I just need to bring the people that do <laughs> together. So sometimes you might feel when you're right. I toured it so many times, I've broken. Um, but so I think just, you know, 
taking risks, and, you know, things, a lot of this work just hasn't been done before, but it's like, all right, let's just do it. And sometimes things don't work out and it's like, okay, well, let's, let's try this and like, and keep, keep moving. So, um, I think we, we build that, um, that circle of trust and, and willingness to try new things. Um, I think that, uh, I think Future Ready Oregon was just a great opportunity to also like dip to the West a little bit. We have our friends in Forest Grove, John Wurst, who has like the most amazing mechatronics program, I think, in the state. Um, and so sometimes we're stuck just with the Hillsboro boundaries. So it's nice when we can like look West and kind of bring some of our, our rural cities um, together to the table to support um, and just kind of think differently about the way that, that we do workforce. Amen to all that. And um, <laughs> if I, I picture myself being an alien flying in from outer space and looking at my community and asking myself questions like, well, how come everybody doesn't uh, speak Spanish and English in this community? Because like half of us do. Or how come we don't have an aerospace program? Because the airport's right there. And um, it's, I think what is unique about this is that we're looking authentically at what is there in front of us and what our students are facing. And then how do we prepare ourselves that that makes sense? And uh, wait, this is funny, but uh, Dolly Parton wasn't that popular like 20 years ago, but all of a sudden everybody's like championing Dolly Parton. It's like this hero of American music, which is great because she deserves it. 10 years ago though, we were using the quote, figure out who you are and do it on purpose. Dolly Parton said that. <laughs> and we're trying to figure out who we are and do it on purpose and acting purposefully around Advanced manufacturing makes sense for Hillsboro. It makes sense for the students that I serve. So I think what's unique about our partnership is that we're responding to the local context and we're partnering to make sense of the world and create pathways. So shout out to Dolly Parton. <laughs> I don't think we can really go anywhere from there. <laughs> that just feels <laughs> space aliens and Dolly Parton. Um, I think that actually provides us a really great place to uh, wrap our time with this panel today. Um, what I am excited about is that uh, these panelists are members of this consortium. So we have this fantastic resource available to us as we do our work. And, um, and while we don't have time for questions right now, as Erin mentioned, um, we'll be diving deeper into some of these uh, types of questions in your breakout groups. And uh, we will make sure that this group is evenly dispersed uh, throughout both of the breakout groups so that if there are questions about the partnership, you have the opportunity to ask those. Um, with that, Erin, I'm just gonna take the mic and um, dismiss you for grabbing lunch. You, you have been sitting and patient and talked at for a really long time. Um, we have about a 15 minute break now. The intention is that you can get up, move around, get your lunches, but you can eat your lunch while the next panel is presenting. So take advantage of the next 15 minutes to stretch, connect with new and um, renewed friendships in the room and we'll call you back at about five minutes after um, to start our next panel. All right, hopefully that was a good few minutes to just stretch the legs, connect with each other, um, but the next half hour, 45 minutes, um, we'll be hearing from uh, some of our community partners about the work that they're doing to advance a diverse manufacturing workforce and um, please continue to eat your lunch and um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Um, otherwise, same as we've mentioned before, after this we'll be moving into your breakout groups and have an opportunity for you to have a facilitated conversation that will dive a little bit deeper into uh, into what we've been hearing today. So first, um, so happy to have you all with us. Uh, why don't we just take a minute to have you introduce yourselves and um, and your organization. And uh, because we're dealing with the mic back and forth, I'll just say 
why don't we jump right into um, telling us a little bit about your program and its track record of connecting underrepresented populations to high demand manufacturing jobs. So a um, little bit of introduction and then tell us a little bit about your programs. And Adam, you have the privilege of sitting next. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Adam Whalen. I'm the director of secondary partnerships for the Willamette Education Service District down in Salem, Oregon. And so I oversee um, some of our career and technical um, education um, in Marion, Polk, and Hill counties, uh, as well as some of our higher education partnerships. Um, in, uh, two years ago, we launched the Willamette Career Academy, which was a partnership with Mountain West Investment Corporation, uh, which was the first regional uh, career and technical um, education center in the state, serving multiple districts, we're serving 16 school districts. Uh, this coming year with six programs in um, cosmetology, health science, path A diesel, uh, freighters, manufacturing, um, IT, and construction. So uh, I also oversee uh, some of the um, Juvenile Detention and Youth Corrections programs uh, in very important um, and, and the first question, so I, I kind of uh, braided in with, uh, um, within my introduction, kind of um, some of the programs that I uh, work with. It's a pretty, uh, it's uh, pretty diverse and each day can be different in terms of um, what I do uh, day to day, but the one program that I kind of wanted to highlight here was uh, the Lima Career Academy, and I had a canned answer that was like, Travis, what do you think? But Travis was on a different panel than I was. So that doesn't work. Um, but that has just been a ton of work and just kind of speaks to the power of partnership, especially private public partnerships to move the needle in terms of equity. Um, I'm happy to report that of the 300 some students that will attend this year, about 55% of those students are students of color. Um, and so we have really moved the needle in terms of recruiting uh, students from diverse backgrounds um, to the Career Academy. And so that's um, an enormous success um, because uh, career and technical education is not always accessible to all the students around our state and region. The average high school has about 3.1 programs of study um, of CTE. And so we are thrilled uh, in partnership with Mountain West and their generosity to be able to bring. Uh, more programs of study to students in Marion, Polk, and Hill County. Thank you. My name is Abigail Lewis. I'm the founder and executive director of Golden Rule Reentry. Uh, we're down in Medford, so we're representing Southern Oregon here. Sorry. Uh, we work with the formerly incarcerated. We are trauma informed, and we engage the community. Um, and we do foster connection through kinship networking classes and services that focus on professional and personal growth. Uh, we are very small. Uh, I thought it'd be fun to start an organization during COVID. So we started in 2020. Uh, we are uh, small but mighty and growing and we are very intentional about how we're doing this. And we are so excited to be here at this consortium. It's, it's brilliant uh, that we are, um, that you guys have been able to pull together this diverse group. And we're very excited that community-based organizations are invited to the table. Because just like we treat people as full spectrum and we understand that there's more to people than just one aspect, uh, what we're trying to accomplish here also um, by looking at community-based organizations, I do feel that you're taking into account some of the, like bamboo, some of the roots that aren't necessarily visible from the outside. What Golden Rule is doing is, again, we mentioned a, a, a whole person approach. And... I was extremely excited to find this report about essential employability skills that the um, Workforce and Talent Development Board put together. Um, in there, it talks about how a lot of the skills that employers are looking for are things that happen when people are very young. Uh, we work with the formerly incarcerated, and unfortunately for a lot of them, their personal story is a story where they didn't get that attention when they were younger. So we are focusing on um, helping them develop their life skills. One of the ways we are unique is that we are, uh, we just launched Golden Rule Residential. Thanks to my uh, development director here, Paul Sheldon, we now have two houses. And our programs are going to be immersive um, because people coming out of prison are used to an immersive environment. And so we're slowly transitioning them into a way to build up their base skill set uh, in a way that's comfortable for them. Um, 
you know, when you haven't had to make decisions for decades, but potentially on what to eat, what to wear, all of these type of things, what to cook, what to, you know, we're taking that into consideration as we build them through a, a community volunteer program. Uh, and then we're slowly, uh, so they're learning team building. We're going to partner with Habitat for Humanity. So they're learning team building, they're learning skills, they're being outside, they're doing things like that as we gently move them into workforce development. And our program is covering five essential areas. Look at my notes so that I don't mess it up. But we're doing personal development, and this is 20 weeks while they're living at our house uh, of uh, personal development skills, social and employability to skills, uh, technical training, which means how to use their cell phones, how to use computers financial literacy and health, well-being, and nutrition. Um, because I don't think it's fair just to give people a resume and a pat on the back and an interview and skills and expect them to get out there in the workforce, especially when there are so many barriers against people who have criminal backgrounds. So these are the approaches that we're taking. Uh, we are also, we have a lot of community partners who offer their services for free. Uh, we have a neurofeedback um, which, uh, person who's working with our people to help um, of traumatic brain injury, anger, PTSD type issues, and also structure of intellect is something we're going to do, which is a comprehensive assessment. Sorry, it's a comprehensive assessment that can help identify intellectual deficiencies and then actually address them. It's where we help people learn, help people um, cogitate, and then uh, you know, apply the information that they've learned. And sometimes people who might look like they have a learning disability literally have a problem with their eyes. And instead of reading and going to the next line down, their eye jumps down four lines. We can identify that and then use um, skills building uh, approaches so that by the time they come out of our program, we may not have taught them everything about manufacturing, but we're very focused on the essential employability skills that have been identified and we're going to bring to the manufacturing community people that are very grateful for the opportunity um, to do this. I have so much more to say, but I'm going to pass the mic. <laughs> Cameron Ferry from the Muse Research Center, and I'm going to talk to my colleague here because she's going to address the first one. Um, thank you. I'm Madison Coniglio. I'm the program manager for employment services at Demunis Resource Center. We are um, the smallest program, similar to you, Reentry Day. We're small but mighty. Um, and so we're part of Mid Willamette Valley Community Action Agency and we're the reentry piece. So we are actually a resource um, and referral center and we are physically attached to the Marion County Transition Center. So we are able to serve folks while they are incarcerated at the Transition Center um, right next door to parole and probation. So we are working with a lot of folks on supervision in Marion County. And then anybody who walks in our doors, we are a true walk-in resource center. So Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, you can find your way to us and you are encountering barriers due to any any background from 20 years ago, um, from a different state, just if that is part of your history, then we will try our best to help you guide you, support you. Um, so yeah, going into what the first question here, I've talked a little bit about our program. So a huge piece of our program has always been employment um, and it continues to grow. We brought on a camera, um, thanks to our capacity building grant Future Ready Oregon, we were able to bring on that outreach piece. Um, before we brought on camera, I was very much a one-woman one woman show, providing those client services and then trying to do some outreach to employees, but it's, it's very difficult. It's a lot of work. So I'm super thankful for Tamara. She's been doing the floor running. Um, for the capacity building has included a trying to do expand out into Yamhill and Polk County, which is new for us. So we've gotten to engage lots of employers. It's been really exciting um, to just really see that there's quite a few opportunities for us to connect our folks to um, employers who need um, eager and productive employees, which our clients are. Um, so yeah, we we've, employment's always been a huge focus for us, but we're growing um, and we're also becoming more specialized, which is exciting. Um, so we can really meet our clients' needs and therefore employers' needs. Um, so just an example, um, in 2022, we served uh, 1,015 unique clients and of those 829 of them received some sort of employment services. That could be a presentation from an employer coming to talk to them about opportunities. That might be something as simple as helping them fill out an online job application, or it can be more intensive individualized career coaching. It might be supportive services, helping them buy some work here. So 
um, pretty wide spe spectrum of, of what we can help them with. Um, and with that, our unique approach, I feel what we do best is meet our clients where they're at. Um, what I really appreciate about the way our program operates is we're very responsive. So we aren't um, interested in fitting them in some box that we think is best for them. Of course, we want to be there to guide and support them. And we want to be on our end, want to pay attention to the trends and the needs and what um, high demand jobs are out there. But at the end of the day, they've got, they've got to pay their bills, right? So, so um, while workshops and all of these things, and that's certainly part of what we look to do in the future is building that fully responsive curriculum. Um, if they come and they want a job and they need to pay their bills and they even want just like a day job for now because they've got to pay something that's due tomorrow, that's what I'm going to help them get, right? So it's not about kind of, um, well, well, what about, you know, your GED? I would love for all of our clients to have their GED, but they know what their life circumstances are and they know what their most immediate needs are. And I'm there to meet those most immediate needs and then be there. Hopefully they come back and see us in a few months or in a year and they're ready to tackle some of those more longer term goals. Um, so yeah, I, we really do tailor our services or individualized services to what clients need. And we also tailor classes, workshops. We're just, we try to be as flexible as possible. We try to respond to what clients are saying they actually need support with. Um, as far as successes, uh, I'd say one of the biggest successes is we just have really solid partnerships and that's with employers, that's with staffing agencies, that's with other service providers. Um, we really are seen as a very trusted resource in the community, and so um, that's really nice to see, and employers continue to consistently come back to us to see if we have folks that work for them, and that, that tells me it's working, which is really nice to see. Um, and the challenges, um, lots of challenges, of course, uh, working with this client population, um, as Abigail touched on, because they have a lot of, a lot of barriers, um, and I think most of biggest barrier is the way that society views them, um, which is really unfortunate. Uh, so, but one of the more specific challenges I'd say is, as we're talking about manufacturing, getting into this field, and it kind of got touched on, which is interesting, is being hired at entry level and then really encountering a lot of roadblocks to advancement, um, particularly when we're talking about folks that do have limited education um, or limited experience in the way that we expect them, right? So they can have some really great experience, amazing soft skills, but are they kind of checking those boxes? Um, they're seen as warm bodies and disposable and kind of just meeting a need right, right now, but are we investing in these folks? Are we seeing them as part of that, that community and seeing them, um, helping them identify those opportunities for growth and advancement? Um, and so, and a lot of this comes from a lack of honest uh, communication on both sides from the employer and the employee, and that is kind of born out of a lack of safety. So very often what we hear from our clients is that they don't feel safe or comfortable saying, for instance, hey, I can't work on this day because I have my treatment classes. Hey, I've got to go check in with my PO. And it's so creating these kind of environments where folks, you know, because very often an employer might say, well, she would have told me and you know and then it turns into a no-show it turns but is that environment safe was it actually somewhere they felt they could say that and then they wouldn't be judged or it wouldn't be gossiped about or so yeah i really do see that um one of the biggest challenges is that upward mobility um and that support along the way um to enable that So unique barriers. Um, I first want to touch on the fact that it's just become really apparent to me, and I think it's really important to remind folks that we have to incorporate reentry into the DEI conversation. It's it's not a separate conversation. I pass this out just because it's a nice snapshot um, of some just statistics and basics and some of our services, but just to remind folks that you know one in three Americans has a criminal record. Um, 
that black adults are six times more likely to be incarcerated than white adults and Latinx adults are three times as likely, right? So there's a hugely disproportionate impact on communities of color with mass incarceration. Not only that, but I really don't think people realize how diverse the formerly incarcerated population is. And what I mean by that is it touches every single priority population. There are higher rates of incarceration with LGBTQ plus folks. There are higher rates of incarceration um, with veterans um, and with individuals with disabilities, right? Um, as well as with that incarceration or prior to in conjunction with um, adding to what those unique barriers are with all these populations, there are also higher rates of mental health issues um, and substance use issues, right? So unfortunately that trauma that often leads to incarceration is then exacerbated by the incarceration itself. And this trauma then really can impact an individual's life immensely with mental health struggles, substance abuse leading to homelessness, um, lack of treatment therefore with the homelessness and, and just exacerbating those issues further. In addition, these uh, you touched on this greatly, um, Abigail, around um, it also impacts how they can understand how they're impacted by stimuli in the workplace, right? How well are they gonna understand written instructions um, and how comfortable again, is there that safety to ask questions, to express I'm not quite understanding. Um, this is my favorite part. I said this at the last panel. I love that I get to talk about the strengths because there's so many. Um, honestly, really many of the most valuable soft skills identified by any employer, these skills are so prevalent within this community. Um, our folks are so very culturally competent. As I touched on, the formerly incarcerated population is very diverse. So um, I don't think people appreciate how um, well formerly incarcerated folks work with others, right? They, they know how to live with lots of people. They have to learn how to, how to kind of navigate that and they are directly exposed to a lot of people that they would have never otherwise been exposed to if they, they weren't incarcerated. Um, so they're empathetic. Um, they're natural leaders and mentors because of their own lived experience. They, they want to support and help others as well. Um, and they're excited to learn. They, they're, they're excited to learn, they're eager to learn. Um, they're loyal and hardworking. We hear this time and again from employers who are third chance employers that their folks with uh, backgrounds are probably their most loyal and productive employees. And, um, and they're resourceful, right? So they're, they're gonna figure it out and um, they're going to be self-starters and they're, they're, they're really gonna make the most of, of what's available to them because that's what they've, they've always had to do. So that all. So one of the things oh, I've got to figure this out. Can you hold it lower? Okay. Okay. Uh, one of the things about the formerly incarcerated is they are forced by society to constantly be looking backwards in time. It's all about their past. I mean, how would any of us like the worst thing you ever did to be the thing on your t-shirt everywhere you go? And that's especially true in the in the workplace. So one of the things I would like to talk to employers about is to keep that in mind. Um, it's very important to be future oriented and not past oriented with this population because they have so much potential and so as, um, as Madison was saying, so many strengths. Um, and so to what we're calling it is our prison to prosperity pipeline. So I'm sure you've all heard of this prison pipeline. So we wanna turn that around and make it the prison to prosperity pipeline. One thing that, that is pretty apparent um, because trauma is such a, a, a prevalent factor with our population is that does lead to uh, often lead to addictive behaviors. The reason I work with this population and love it so much is people that can overcome the myriad of barriers and obstacles that they've overcome. These people are fantastic. And you have to understand that many of them, their crimes were committed while they were in active addiction. So if you've got someone who's got something in their background and they are, they move past that and they're now in recovery and they're taking control of their life, it's really, um, I, don't use, I don't like the word unfair, but it's really not fair to hold them to this thing that happened back when they were using uh, substances and, and not, their heads weren't straight. So if you've got someone who's, who's taking control of the, their life, you're looking at, like Madison said, you're looking at a leader, you're looking at someone who's not unconscious in their life, they've become very self-aware, very conscious of 
their place in the world. And they are very loyal because they understand that they're being given an opportunity. So I think those, those are some things to consider. Um, yeah, and I, I uh, you know, people that have been given this chance really do appreciate it. So they will be loyal and they will be assets to your community. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna sort of, though a lot of what you're saying is resonating with me as well, and I'm tempted to, to keep the theme alive. I'm gonna pivot a little bit to just um, engagement with uh, K-12 students in terms of manufacturing. And I think one thing that this group has is sort of an uphill battle in terms of what is manufacturing and how do you explain the sector to youth. Um, I, I highlighted some of the programs that we have at the Millennium Career Academy. When students and families hear construction, they know what they're going to do. When they hear cosmetology, uh, they know what they're going to do. But when we say manufacturing and pre engineering, it takes them a while. And so a lot of times, industry is really reliant upon the K-12 community and K-12 leaders to educate students on pathway work when we don't have the language to do it justice. Um, and so that's been a really uh, unique challenge. I think, I don't wanna um, speak for Salem Kaiser, but they started um, the, their career and technical ed center and they experienced a lot of what we experienced with the first year that we launched the manufacturing program. We had a really hard time um, in, in we looked, um, you know, as a domain, um, how do how do we engage these uh, diverse students and families to come um, learn about this program of study? And what it ultimately took, and I think Salem Kaiser experienced the same thing, was students participating in the program, figuring it out, saying, "No, this is what you actually do." Um, and so that's been, you know, a big challenge. But part of it is, uh, it's not just you have to explain it to the student, but you need understand the pathway too. Um, in in a, a lot of times if they speak a language other than you, if we don't have the words to explain in English, we're not going to effectively communicate it um, in a different language um, as well. So that's just one highlight. Um, that that is something we continue to tackle. We look at a rebrand. We work with Frayers to uh, now we officially call it um, manufacturing and pre-engineering and that's helped some of course it gets students to notice it a little bit better. But that is something that has been uh, really challenging, um, especially in the center. All right, thank you. So I would love to hear from each of you a bit about um, the role that public-private partnerships play in advancing a diverse manufacturing workforce. What are the key components to successful partnerships that include industry and employers education and training partners, and community-based organizations. Adam, do you want to start this one? Um, I'll start by saying, and I see some of our friends from the Heck and ODE in here, and I think Jeff's got that. Um, one, one thing that I've appreciated is the work that the Department of Ed has done over the last three, four years as far as creating the, um, the Career Connected Learning Framework and having it's not, you know, it's a pathway, but it's kind of like a, a mobile pathway um, of meaningful ways that students can become engaged in the business and industry. And, and I think we lack that um, as a state for some time to where when we go out and try to engage with our business partners, uh, we jump some steps. We'd say, yeah, let's start an internship program together when maybe what that company needed and what the students need guest speaking opportunities first so that they can kind of both build mutual interest um, in each other. Uh, something that we talk a lot about is the right fit. And we need students to, to really understand these programs. And so having that framework, if you're not familiar with it and you're on the industry side, you can just Google it. There's a PDF that'll pop up that's super helpful. But just having that framework to kind of scaffold how we get our business partners uh, business partners to engage with K-12 has been tremendously helpful. A lot of students that think that they want to do construction, if they jump right to an internship, they're going to learn the hard way that maybe that career is not for them. Um, and so it's the same with any pathway. So having those scaffolded experiences where students can little by little um, get to know what it takes, not just the hard skills, but soft skills as well, uh, to be successful in that sector is really important. <laughs> 
I'm somewhat new to the to this and to the world of manufacturing, and I, I have to say that that this consortium is in itself, I think, an incredibly effective thing. I know the golden rule. We we involve the community because I know that most people you get what you get from who you know, and it's very helpful when we're in this social services sector to meet people in industries so that we can actually understand what it is you're looking for, and you can understand. Who it is we're working with. These things are really, really important. Um, I was also reflecting last night when I was looking over the materials, just the fact that all this funding has come from the, the government to, to do this. And like the war on drugs, money poured into it, and it was, you know, incredibly well funded and, and incredibly well executed with terrible results. This is a, a very, uh, hopefully very well funded and very well executed, very intentional gathering and I, I think it's wonderful to be able to see how I love it the needs of industry meeting the needs of, of divert you know equity and, and justice it's it's really awesome the way that it's coming together so I'm not terribly experienced so I don't have a lot of wisdom to depart in part but I would say that um, I'm very grateful that this is happening I think it's a great start for us thank you um, one of the key components that we're finding, um, and I love that we're building a pipeline and we're starting in the K-12, and I have a 15-year-old grandson who's taken advantage of some of us, and I think that's so exciting. But I want to make sure that we're also aware of the adults who might be needing some of that training and some of that knowledge. One of the things that I've been doing when I've been going out to meet employers is saying, Give me a, a list of three things that if I could build a perfect employee, what would you like me to make sure that they were able to do? You know, homelessness or finding adequate housing, finding transportation, I was there. But when I talk about some of the skills, we're talking soft skills, we're talking computer adjacent skills. Um, you know, they say computer literate, well, what does that mean? Well, as it, in reality, what it means is we do our onboarding online. I want them to be able to figure out how to use the payroll system online. This kind of stuff, it's computer adjacent skills. And then maybe there's some skills on the floor that they need to be able to, on the production floor that they need to be able to learn. So what we need to do is look at what skills are needed within the manufacturing industry that maybe we can tap into now. Maybe we can tap into as a resource that we can offer, you know, the, the clients that we work with and make sure that they get trained. Um, there are on-the-job trainings, and all of that is really wonderful. I will tell you that I worked most of my career as an HR, and HR of one in 300 does not have time to do an on-the-job training. It doesn't work. It's a really nice idea, and in reality, it does not always work. So we need to find a way to get the training available to the people who need it without burdening the kind of people that we're asking to hire them. The other thing that is really important, and we talked about the safe spot, we need to make sure that the company itself is embracing the idea of diversity in their hiring practices. That if somebody, we talked to one HR person who he had to go up and have some, uh, an employee sign a form, the employee freaked out thinking that somehow because he had a background he was getting fired because they questioned him about this form. You know, and that's, un that's unfortunately the reality that happens a lot of times. So we need to have leadership. We need to have an understanding of culture within the community that everyone is here to do a job. We hire them to do a job and only when they can expect to do the job. And yes, we support everyone on an individual basis and we support everyone together. So we need to make sure to, to applaud those employers instead of kind of hanging their head and going, yeah, we'll take somebody with a background. They're holding up their hand and saying, yeah, we're going to give everybody the opportunity. Um, Can we do the next one? Yeah, okay. Okay. Hang on to the mic. Okay. Thank you. 
Well, I think one of the first things that we've got to figure out is what does manufacturing look like in the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years? Um, I suspect it's going to change a lot. You know, the manual labor jobs are probably, you know, the jobs that you know, everybody is beating down the door because um, they wanted to work, you know, construction, or they wanted to do the manual labor job. Those are going to go away, and they're probably going to really go away for a lot of reasons. But we need to look at what the future looks like and make sure that we are preparing the workforce that we're going to need for that. And that means probably some training, some education, some forethought into that. So I want to I want to make sure that we're looking at at that. Um, we also one of the kind of exciting things that I've noticed, and I touched on it a little bit uh, previously, is that we are seeing, or I I definitely am seeing as I'm going out to employers, I am seeing. Um, obviously, younger leaders coming in to manage companies. With that younger leadership, they're bringing a different view of how they want to see the world work. Um, and that's really exciting. I, I've been pleasantly surprised that I haven't had to break down doors as much as I've had to ask them to be open. And sometimes it's been a very welcoming opening. And so I, I think that we're at a really interesting time within our within this industry and within our society as a whole that people are looking, especially the younger generation, which I call the younger generation because I'm not part of them, but the younger generation wants to work for companies that aren't just getting a paycheck, but they're looking to make society better as a whole. Um, somebody mentioned on one of the previous panels, shared prosperity. Love that expression because I think everybody's kind of starting to realize that if we're all grabbing for our piece of pie, we end up with a mess and nobody really has too much. If we put all of our pieces of pie together, we have enough to serve everyone. So I think that's one of the, the great lessons that, that we have learned. Um, and our advice to our employees is we just be, be proud of the fact that you want to be part of the diverse group. Be proud of the fact that you're willing to give employees a chance. Um, I will tell you, as an, as an HR person who used to work for a second chance employer, without a doubt, some of my favorite employees were people that had I known them previously or before I, I developed a relationship with them, I would have been a bit apprehensive. And that part of that was just that I. That I didn't have a connection with them, but they were also the kind of people that if I I knew if I needed something done, they were my go-to people. They were also my go-to people if I knew somebody else was struggling. I would say, hey, can you kind of work alongside this person and make sure that they're doing okay, make sure that they understand. So you know, I want employers to to look at our reentry clients. And use all of their resources. They're not one disposable body that just go in for a fresh time. They, they, they bring a tremendous amount of life lessons that will just only increase the benefit to the company. I just want to say everything that you just said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everything Tamara said is really um, important and, and relevant. And I think I, I won't just repeat what she just said. I guess I'll just add to it um, that people are people. Um, we all, we look at numbers, we look at uh, statistics, we look at things, but when it comes down to it, no matter how rational you think you are, we're all emotional beings. And uh, our population is no different uh, than any of us. They want to feel respected. They want to feel needed and valued and appreciated. And so it does kind of come down to a work culture and that feeling of safety and that feeling of, um, and part of the safety I think is, is to address their special status up front. So they're not living in fear of you, you know, letting them go because of what they did or, or having them be on a, a tighter leash or anything like that. I think when you can build in hope 
to any employee, uh, the hope for a better future, hope for advancement, and that kind of thing, um, you get a better person, a better employee, because they, they know they're working for something. They're not just working for a paycheck. And so that would be my sort of two cents on that topic. Um, yeah. And I know we're about time, so I'll keep my comments brief. But um, I see my colleague here, Abigail, holding the Workforce and Talent Development Board report on essential skills. And I think there's an outstanding opportunity um, within that to address the soft skills that students learn in high school. Um, in, you know, potentially, I think that these soft skills well, mapping those out to sectors as to what students really need to be good at. Um, and how, how do those highly transferable soft skills trans, uh, transfer from sector to sector? Um, the other opportunity, just because I'll focus on opportunities, um, since that was part of the last question, is just in the work that we've done in public-private partnership, the times that I feel like we've moved the needle the most in terms of creating pathways um, in new opportunities for students specifically has been when we didn't engage kind of company to company, but we really engaged at the association level. And so thinking about who's all in this room, and I see there's a lot of people um, um, in this room um, from the sector, from business and, and, and from nonprofit um, and education, et cetera. But a lot of times those, those kind of service memberships, when they can create change um, at that level, all of their members can benefit from that change. So just something to think about it as you're you know, tackling trying to create new systems and, and think creatively in an entire sector that's super challenging for it. So is there a way to leverage some of those associations? The example uh, that I'll share, we wanted to, to get students more involved in construction. So there were some companies like Cafe and um, Knife River and others that we really wanted to engage with. So instead of engaging directly with them, we engaged with the Oregon Asphalt Paving Association of Oregon that kind of tackled um, and so those those kind of groups can create powerful change, not just for the any company, but uh, like an ADEC, for example, that maybe changes something to recruit a diverse workforce. But taking it up at that kind of consortial level can have some powerful um, outcomes for employees. Great, thank you all so much. I think we are at time, and I'm going to turn it over to Erin, but. Um, thank you all for sharing your insights today, and Erin will tell us what's next. All right, well, we have a lot to process and discuss in our, our working groups. Um, we are going to have 15 minutes to transition to those. Maybe we'll cut it to 10, um, partly just so we can set these up better. So um, we are going to have in this corner over here um, the Expanding Equity and Diversity Group. And then in that corner over there, we're going to have integrating education and training responses. Right, just very quickly before we split, um, all of everything you've heard, all the deep dive presentations this morning were really intended to lay a foundation and inform the conversations we're about to go into. Um, and I just want to emphasize that today is a starting point. So <laughs> we're just starting the conversations. And so this next session gives us a chance to start those conversations. Um, if you notice on your agenda um, under the working groups breakout session, there's a description of each working group and they, they each start with responsible for. And then there's a lot of words that might seem kind of daunting. <laughs> responsible for identifying high value skills and credentials and defining the connected continuum of learning and working uh, that best aligns with training advancement, you know, on and on. Um, that, that sounds like a lot. Uh, so I just want to start us off by letting you all know, responsible for means guiding, informing, brokering, liaison, at liaising as needed to move the for work forward, and that these working groups have staff. So they're being staffed by HAC, they're being staffed by facilitators. So they're just going into the working groups, please keep in mind, Today is a starting point. This is ongoing work. We're just getting started, and you are going to have staff who are helping. So, as we identify, you know, um, what questions do we have? What information do we need? There will be people who can kind of help track that down. All right. So, with that, I'm going to say let's do um, 10 minutes, and so we'll come back at one o'clock 
into the two separate sessions and Turner and I will get those set up um, to have a little more space for, for people to convene around. Great, thank you. All right, we are ready to start back up. So please go ahead and grab your seat. I know it's been it's been a long day. It's been a lot of information, but at least coming from my breakout session, there was a lot of energy. I feel like people got re-energized. Um, we're going to bring bring that energy back into the whole group. And um, would look, really the, the the next 20 minutes, we're we're going to um, hear from the co-chairs, the executive leadership team. They were divided between the two breakout groups. And so this is a chance if you were in that room, you get to hear what happened in this room. If you're in this room, you get to hear what happened in that room. Um, and then we all get to kind of see where there's overlaps, where are their big themes, um, what what does this mean for our work going forward? What are maybe some immediate next steps we can start to identify? So I'm gonna turn this over to our co-chairs and, and they're gonna give us some takeaways from, from the breakout sessions. Who's starting? All right, so Ed and I were part of the group that was focused on education and training and it was a really great conversation. Really, we heard a lot of things and we probably can't summarize all of them, but one of the things that we were really coming away with as a, a theme is looking at some of the macro level challenges or things that are um, really uh, energizing us or thinking about ways that we can bring things to this um, group of how, what's already been done. How do we take some of those things and disseminate them? We talked about innovation hubs or opportunities to bring data information together, have a resource hub and create more networking, but create ways that we take what we know or what we've done as a, a collective group and bring that to a much broader audience and maybe see that as part of the part of the, the um, task at hand here. Um, we also talked about some of the areas that we might need some additional information, data, demographics, and some of the things that we really want to understand and frame around the manufacturing industry as a whole and what we really need when we're talking about those careers and career pathways. Um, I better not be myself. I'll hand it over to Ed for a second. I know he has some stuff to say. I'll take it all day. You'd be welcome to do that. So um, we're going to kind of wing it here, but maybe go back and forth. So um, we started as we were trying to gather our thoughts about what all the things we could talk about. And we had a really good discussion. One of the big impressions for me today is there's so much knowledge in this room. And it's going to be challenging to find a way to pull it all together and get it out into people's hands efficiently so that we're not reinventing the wheel. So we spent some time talking a little bit about that. But Brian and I were just talking about how do you frame this? How do we frame the task? So one perspective would be career and people should feel free to have time to talk about this. Um, is from the perspective of us as partners. So all of us delivering some piece of this, uh, serving this workforce pipeline or this labor market in some way. And the other would be that to flip it around and say, okay, what, how does a participant move through the process? What is their experience? And how do we put, you know, what are the kinds of things we can do to help uh, move them through the pipeline over a lifetime? So maybe coming out of K-12 and then going directly into the workforce. Uh, the statistics that really stuck with me today was this notion that, well, really seven out of ten individuals aren't going to need higher education or at least to be Certainly, I can tell you from the higher ed side, we're more and more focused on the university level. But we have probably a lot of students coming to the university who would be better off not coming to the university. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the fact is, our labor market in the United States and the workforce training system is sort of centralized in that way. That's what we do. I don't know what else I can do in this work. So we were trying to think about, okay, well, um, how do we reframe this problem so that maybe we can inject solutions they go along, help them move through the pipeline, collect good information about them as they go through it, and find ways they can learn about it and, and work through it. 
at OSU at one time we had 90 um, CRM systems operating across the universe. 90 different instances of CRM that you call support requirements. We now have a single CRM and the handoff between our admissions and then our onboarding between our support for students throughout the university or communications with students is relatively seamless. But what if that went beyond OSU? And so we weren't just thinking about the students' experience within one big public university, but within the entire system. So anyway, we were brainstorming about that. It's not all the detail that we talked about, but it's kind of some of what started to fall out uh, for me. And I'll hand it back to Yeah, so that was a really good summary. I think what we were thinking is really how do we create this group as being that resource hub that creates that master CRM and maybe we think about it as a way that as an enterprise or as a state, each of us knows so much about this industry that as we are interacting with an employee, a student, uh, someone who has just experienced job loss, that we all know what resources to point them at because they know that we know exactly what's going to be the best place for them, whether that's the next career training opportunity, whether that's the next um, career counseling group, whether that's the next degree or certificate program that they need. And so maybe thinking about it as that network around how do we support all the people who are serving our industry versus how do we serve the industry? And it's just a different way to think about it. We started, we were trying to really think about how do we level up what we were hearing because we were hearing a lot of ways that we solve the problems in the industry and thinking about what might be a possible solution to that. So I think that's, you know, um, from, you know, there's obviously a lot of what we talked about. We also talked about this industry as a whole and understanding it more holistically and thinking about their, you know, tech jobs, non-tech jobs. What does that mean? There's a lot of different, there's diversity within manufacturing and there's a great deal of it represented here and also statewide. So not only holistically, but also holistically in the state and inclusivity around, you know, this is obviously a, a, a group that's primarily from this metropolitan area. How do we make sure that we are representing the other other partners and other groups that were really is truly a statewide initiative? So that was anything else to add? We did have some conversation around the image of manufacturing and the fact mm -hmm. that see, people seem to be more inclined making and building than they used to be talking about manufacturing. It would be really nice if we could get to the point where a manufacturing second or two, uh, quarter to one or two, or something that we're quote advanced in higher ed or something else. I can tell you when our, within our college of engineering, if we had more students and we had a make and build, we'd have a far more successful college of engineering. So how do we get people beyond that? And we spent a little bit of time talking about how we perceive manufacturing as well as what's going on. Is there any want to go straight for this or do you want to go? Yeah, let's take a few minutes and anybody else from that group, um, any questions? Or... Yeah, let's just take a few minutes to respond to um, to the first group. Any questions? If you weren't in the group or if you were in the group, anything you want to add? Go ahead, Paul. Or let me give you the mic. Maybe I'll <laughs> Dovetailing on what they said, we talked about how, how to address the siloing of manufacturing, healthcare, and tech, and how much overlap is happening. Because manufacturing historically is thought of as less than, how do we reinvent manufacturing so that it becomes more glamorous and more interesting? Uh, and I use the example of farmers markets that have become makers markets and incubators that have become maker spaces where people come to a maker space and they'll rent space to make stuff. But if it was a manufacturing incubator, it would get a different appeal. So how do we redefine manufacturing in ways that, that highlight the meaning and purpose that it has? I'm not just screwing a nut on a bolt or programming a robot that's gonna screw a nut on the bolt. I'm making a medical treatment chair that's gonna help people have healthy teeth and live to a happy old age. It's the old story of the touch of the master's hand. How do we recreate the image of manufacturing so that it overlaps with healthcare and tech and education and childcare and all these other things that it's interwoven with? Anyone else? All right, I'm gonna pass it back to you, Scott. Well, um, 
Our group was the expanding, expanding equity and diversity and, and how we go about doing that in the learning manufacturing workforce. And, you know, we, as you can imagine, with a topic like that, there were a whole uh, a, a diffuse set of, you know, comments and thoughts and, and all, all these areas we're pursuing, just a few of the ones. And, and we, and we kind of, toward the end of our time, got more kind of focused. But let me just uh, throw out a couple of things that were some of the key points made in, in conversations. We talked about a little bit about the presentation that Gail gave about the demographic, the demographic challenges that we're facing. And, you know, it, it, it kind of is the top level of all of this that we're talking about this, which is a changing workforce and how we, how we adjust to that going forward. We spent a lot of time talking about um, the issue that, that Ed and Mariah were talking about with kind of the perceptions of manufacturing and how there remains, we think, a, 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 an old school perception of manufacturing, sweatshops, smokestacks, you know, environmental ruin, um, you know, uh, long days and sweaty environments and, and you die early because you're, you're overworked. And, and that's just not the reality of Oregon manufacturing. Oregon manufacturing is a, uh, a, a it's just an absolute diverse set of innovators and makers. And those are probably the, you know, some of the right words um, that, we, that we've discovered. And, you know, but there is certainly um, a lack of, people don't see that. It's the hidden gem of Oregon. It's the hidden gem of Oregon's economy. As our, uh, as our manufacturing sector. So that, that, but that is a challenge when you're uh, recruiting workforce of folks, finding workforce. Um, we talked about some of the systemic challenges to, um, to, to finding a uh, diverse workforce, uh, formerly incarcerated, BIPOC communities. Uh, you know, we talked about insurance issues and OSHA issues, and, uh, it's, and it was brought up in our, in our group, the concept of negligent hiring which is this concept in HR departments, which says that if you hire somebody and then that person does something negligent, they are responsible. Although it was also brought up in our conversation that this happens almost nowhere ever, but it still is a, it still seems to be a driving force in a lot of the decision making that's happening at the, at the industry level. So that is a challenge. Uh, we talked a lot about um, understanding cultural competence and understanding cultural differences. And we spent a lot of time getting, you know, and I, I, Appreciate Steve Johnson on this. That we need to be, I guess, even more, much more granular than kind of just throwing everything in this BIPOC column because BIPOC doesn't really say anything. We have so many different communities, so many different cultures, and just kind of lumping all of them into one doesn't solve the problem any better than not addressing it at all. And that's so that's something that we have to get a lot better on and have it drive a lot of the work we're doing here. And then I'll say we kind of we kind of fitting you know so that was some of the broader themes. What we got to and spent most of the time talking about in our group was making sure and, and you know first of all start out we have to make sure we properly identify the problem. Um, so we talked about you know is it, is it a workforce problem? Is it an industry problem? Is it an education problem? Is it something other than those things? And, and the answer to all of that is yes. And the ratios are to be determined, and you know we'll have more conversation about that. But part of that conversation led to kind of where we, I think we landed, which is we, we will be unsuccessful. Uh, we will be too diffuse. We will, we will spin our wheels. We'll make little inroads in little areas, but not, but not really tip the scale unless we can have a shared version of success, a shared vision of success um, among all the, the players. And it starts with industry, but it's not just industry. It's industry. It's education, it's government, it's the workforce. I mean, it's it's the it's the people in the communities. Um, but one of the points we got to is that industry, you know, industry has the need, so industry needs to be a leader in this and kind of helping to define that. I think we probably finished off with trying to understand, make sure we understand where we are because we can't really have a, a shared vision of success. We can't understand the. Um, you know, the metrics and the qualitative, but certainly the quantitative measures that go in that, unless we know where we are. And so having good data to start and then having a shared vision of where we need to get to is important. One of the steps to get there that we talked about, we, we finished with this, was making sure that in that room, you know, that proverbial room, if you will, um, are, are, you know, all those players, but specifically from an industry perspective, to make sure that we have industry representatives from the communities that we're talking about, from the minority communities that we're talking about. That's going to be hard to do. Um, there are some obvious ones that we talked about, you know, just to name one, Latino Chamber of Commerce, 
the construction of minority-based construction organizations, but to make sure that we're getting those people in the room, frankly, be the missionaries for what we're trying to do here, to be the outreach, to help us understand what's needed, and to convey the message into those communities, and that's what we see. So I'm sure there's a lot more that I missed. Do you want to? Yeah. <coughs> um, So it's one of those conversations that you've always wanted to have, but you just have the opportunity. So we just like went crazy at all these different things. And then we finally got to the end. I think the big one to walk away for me was, you know, we got to define, define, define. So we got to define the, 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 the work that we're trying to do. Um, so we can have that shared vision. Um, and then we can take that shared vision, um, that shared success um, and localize it uh, based on the communities that Oregon is very diverse. The charter that we have, um, it is not just about BIPOC. Um, and there's you know lots of other components that we have not certainly addressed. Um, you know, we're looking at gender equity, we're looking at the LGTB uh, community. I mean, so there's all these other components under the charter that we're working from. So it's these deeper conversation of defining these things. Um, and industry has to be at the forefront because they know their space, right? They know um, the challenges that they have. Um, so ultimately, lesson learned, we didn't have enough time. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of people have a lot of passion around the subject. Um, so, yeah. What's a CRM? Customer relationship management. It's essentially an information system to track engagement with somebody. Um, we used to have 90 of them serving various student populations, and they were integrated. So students would have very different experiences across the OSU. Their experience in OSU would be highly variable. But think about everybody how when we talk about this at OSU, um, you know, we're used to ordering on Amazon one click. They don't want to go to the register of the banks and fill out a form. And they don't, certainly don't want to have 14 different CRMs communicating with them. So it's a completely different digitally oriented student body now. Let me add one thing to this last point. I, I meant to mention it. Um, I think we should work really hard to get a full representation across the state. Somebody made this point in our group. East, West, Coast, Valley, Mountains, High Desert. There's a lot of diverse manufacturing in Oregon. This is a great opportunity to get it represented here, and I don't think it's fully represented. So that was what I was going to stress. Okay, so we're going to have. All right, great. Well, I think both groups really good. Takeaways, Jonathan, I loved how you ended by saying you didn't have enough time because uh, that's a great setup for the next time this group comes together, <laughs> that there's still a lot to discuss. And like I said earlier, today was a starting point, um, but it's great to see the themes that have already started to come out, the ability to identify what information we need, um, but then the staff can go start cracking that down and look into um, increasing you know, that diversity of, of state representation here. So scanning the room looking for Anne. <laughs> so we have with us Anne Mercero, who is um, the chair of the Oregon Workforce and Talent Development Board, and she is going to, to provide a few remarks for us. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, evangelists, whoever said that over <laughs> missionaries, I think you said I use the word evangelist, um, for this really important work. Um, I'm excited for all of you and to have this milestone today that you've launched and you're setting the pace for the good work ahead. I heard earlier Jennifer was like, she counts in like one minute for her is really 15 seconds. So it's like, pick up the pace, what I took from that. I appreciate the comments about an aligned ecosystem. I think it's really critical um, for the work ahead if we're gonna gain some traction and um, not re waste resources or time. Um, and be able to create something that is putting the user at the center of the experience. I think one of you used the word experience 
in the description of your breakout session and how important that is and having a shared vision of success so you can all, we all can stay connected together um, and move forward together. Uh, the co-creation of statewide sector specific workforce and talent development strategies that engage in advanced diverse workforce will be a hallmark for Oregon and our ability to be recognized as having a vibrant workforce with the ability to serve its people. It's critical. Um, I want to share with you that in June, so my day job at PGE, um, I lead human resources and we hosted our um, board of directors over at OMSI. It was a community-based event and the room was full of all kinds of dynamic community leaders, including community college, tribal partners, transportation, government, labor, clean energy partners. So, you know, we were all about talking about clean energy. And the topic that all these community members were discussing at their tables was how do we think about a community that should work together to balance the goals of affordability, reliability, and resiliency while we execute on this clean energy transition? So no, I'm not going to talk to you about electrons and things like that because what they ended up talking about was workforce. Every single table in that room brought up workforce as critical um, and being universally critical to um, our ability to move forward in, in the PG sector and being you know, in the clean energy future, but for everything. So when I think about the work you're embarking on today, I am reminded about how critical each one of you is to this work. Our communities are counting on our leadership uh, to drive a thriving Oregon. It will make a difference for, for our future. What will make this work and this group so effective is the convening of employers. I appreciated the, the call to make sure industries um, participating, industry leaders, education, training providers, labor organizations, and community partners in government. And the work ahead will not be easy. We won't always agree on things, and you'll likely encounter barriers, frustrations, uh, maybe even conflicting priorities. So please use data, workforce supply and demand data to support your work. Look for quick wins so you feel the, the tailwinds of moving forward. Don't be afraid to eliminate gaps and persistent issues in our system, but don't get hung up on those in terms of creating momentum and being able to push forward. Um, the work is critical and it's urgent. So just here to encourage you, let you know that we're counting on you and appreciate your commitment of time and talents today. So thank you for spending the day here. And um, I count on you because we need transformers, which are made in the manufacturing sector. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need that to keep our lights on. So thank you for, for that, for the good work in the manufacturing sector. Thank you. 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 All right, well, I think we're going to end a little early today. Um, we do have just a final wrap up. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming, for your energy, for um, the big ideas, I think, that started to come out in the breakout sessions and the working groups. And um, just a, a word of encouragement to, to bring that energy and to bring those big ideas, bring them back to the next gathering of this group. I'm going to pass this to Turner so he can talk about what next steps we look like for this group and kind of what the expectations are going forward um, and, and when you'll come back together. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. It's like the handing off of the baton. <laughs> this is not much of a baton. Um, but I, I, I have the pleasure mostly of returning you, which you'll be happy to know what happened probably 25 minutes ago. So I only have a couple things to say. And that is that we will be reconvening this group, uh, and I will be your facilitator uh, for its first quarterly meeting sometime in October. Uh, and then Jennifer, make sure I state that. In the interim, uh, our executive leadership group meet and with uh, Jennifer and Heck staff support and plan out that meeting and, and uh, debrief this one and be ready to move this group forward next time. Uh, the working groups will likely not convene until after that first quarterly meeting in October. So sometime in October. But we have a second quarterly meeting after that very short quarter that ends in December. <laughs> so uh, with that, I think that's it. Any questions or comments? Last words for the go to the order. All right, in that case, thank you all very much for spending your time with us today. We really appreciate all the effort that goes into this. <laughs>